Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the Energy and Commerce uh, Communication and Technology Subcommittee and uh, appreciate you all being here and uh, look forward uh, to a good hearing today. Before I uh, begin, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate our ranking member, uh, the general lady from California, and I look forward to working with you this year. And uh, I know it's gonna be a good relationship. And uh, I just uh, think that uh, we can get a lot done this Congress. And as I said, I'm looking forward to a lot of good things. But as I said, uh, again, good morning to the 118th Congress, and it's uh, a privilege again to have you all here as our witnesses. And it's been over a decade since the subcommittee held a hearing dedicated to understanding the satellite communications marketplace and the FCC's role in licensing, <clears throat> pardon me, commercial satellite communication systems. Since then, how satellite technology is used has changed, has changed drastically. Our esteemed panel before us has experience across the full range of satellite communication technologies. Satellite technology offers a variety of services spanning high-speed broadband and video delivery to data services that enable precision agriculture and global financial transactions. Today's hearing is the first step this committee is taking as we take a close look at these novel issues. In recent years, satellite communication capabilities have dramatically advanced and satellite operators have identified new ways to serve customers with greater speed and reliability. Many satellite operators currently operate or are seeking to operate different types of satellite constellations. Some satellite systems operate in geostationary orbit, while others operate closer to Earth in non-geostationary orbit. Satellite operations are also global in nature, which adds an additional layer of complexity when developing and operating <coughs> systems. Because satellite systems rely on radio spectrum to operate, the use of this spectrum raises complex challenges that U.S. and international regulators must address. In the last few months, satellite operators and cellular carriers have announced partnerships to stretch connectivity further into rural and remote areas. International standard bodies are also making progress in identifying technical specifications for greater integration of 5G with satellite communications technologies. These are significant developments that may provide new or enhanced opportunities to connect unserved Americans. We must also ensure continued American leadership in advanced communication services. In order to do that, our regulations must foster an environment of innovation and certainty. As countries like China seek to dominate the technologies of the future, we must make the United States an attractive place to invest in cutting edge developments that align with American values and guarantee the availability of trusted satellite communications. The FCC plays an important role in licensing new or enhanced satellite communication systems. It is important we understand the current licensing and regulatory process and the impact these rules have on our international competitiveness. Again, thank you to our witnesses for sharing your expertise today. And again, I look forward to today's discussion. And at this time, the chair recognizes the general lady, the subcommittee ranking member from California for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and it's a privilege for me to be sitting on this dais with you, and I look forward to working with you on these issues that will impact all of America. It's an exciting day, and it's no exaggeration to say that our subcommittee has more bearing on the United States technological leadership in the 21st century than any other, from expanding affordable broadband access to developing the next generation of communications network we have a unique opportunity to promote innovation and equity in technology. I'm excited to get to work continuing the subcommittee's strong tradition of bipartisanship. Today's hearing on the satellite marketplace is a perfect example of that cooperation in action. This hearing is both important and timely. As Chairwoman Rosenworcel has said, the number of applications for satellites before the FCC has never been higher. For the United States to remain the pace setter in satellite communication, the number of applications for satellites before the FCC has never been higher. For the United States to remain the pace setter in satellite communication, we need to modernize satellite governance to keep up with innovation. Thankfully, both Congress and the FCC are focusing on modernizing satellite regulations to ensure that they are prepared for the next generation of innovation. Chairwoman McMorris-Rogers and Ranking Member Pallone's SAT Streamlining Act 
will introduce important updates to the FCC satellite laws. For too long, the licensing process at the FCC has fallen short of what the market needs, and this bill will help. Ranking Member Pallone and Chairwoman Rogers also teamed up on the Secure Space Act. As an original co-sponsor of the Rip and Replace Bill, I'm glad to see additional bipartisan engagement on a vital national security issue. In the same way, our Rip and Replace Bill will remove vulnerable network gear from companies like Huawei and ZTE, the Secure Space Act would extend these protections to the satellite ecosystem. And, and since we're on the topic, I'd like to take a moment at this hearing to remind everyone that we still have urgent work to do on the rip and replace effort. The funding shortfall is real, it is urgent, and I'm ready to get the job done with you. But back to today's hearing, it's important to note just how much progress has been made by the FCC over the past few months on satellite issues. Last year, Chairwoman Rosenwarzo announced a plan to form the Space Bureau to better support the needs of the growing satellite industry. The Chairwoman is also turning a critical eye toward the FCC's processes to keep them modern and effective. She recently initiated a rulemaking to request feedback on ways to reduce the timelines for satellite and Earth station applications. I'm glad to see the FCC tackling these issues head on and believe we have a meaningful opportunity to make progress. And that's why I sent a letter with my Spectrum Caucus co-chair, Congressman Guthrie, urging the FCC to take steps that will support innovation and consumer choice. In our letter, we urge the FCC to develop additional coordination requirements for satellite operators. Good faith coordination should include meaningful and continuous requirements to ensure the appropriate flow of technical information. And as more satellites share operations on limited spectrum, finding ways to encourage spectral efficiency will be important. Across all forms of wireless communication, we need to do more with less, and satellites are no different. Finally, we urge the FCC to strike an appropriate balance between protecting the investments of incumbent operators while allowing new entrants to innovate and compete. I really look forward to staying engaged with the FCC as it moves forward with this rulemaking and confident and reinforce American leadership. Thank you, Chairman Lada, and thank you for the witness and look forward to the hearing. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your statement. And at this time, the chair will recognize the general lady from Washington, the chair of the full Energy and Commerce Committee for her opening statement for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations on leading this committee. I know that you're dedicated and experienced on, on all of these issues and look forward to your leadership on the subcommittee and Buddy Carter for becoming the, the vice chair, as well as Doris Matsui, Congresswoman Matsui as ranking leader. We look forward to working with you to make sure that we stay the leader. I know that this committee is going to be at the forefront of closing the digital divide and ensuring America leads a new era of innovation and entrepreneurship. So just congratulations to all. I uh, also want to uh, welcome our new members on the committee. They bring great experience and passion to these issues. We're here today to discuss how America can keep pace with the rapidly evolving satellite communications industry. Countries like China seek to undermine us in, in this range of advanced communication technologies, including next-gen satellite technology. We cannot afford to let this happen. The Chinese Communist Party will do whatever it takes to embed their authoritarianism into next generation technologies like these. This is a country that spies on its citizens and asserts strict government control over businesses and the economy. They want to replace the United States as the economic and technological power so that they can spread their values and vision of the future. We need to make sure these technologies are developed in an ecosystem that promotes America's values. As this technology evolves, we must reevaluate and adapt the regulatory environment to make sure that America is winning the future, that we're beating China, and continue to push the limits of innovation to solidify American dominance. Satellite technologies have become vital to the communications marketplace, providing services to connect millions of America's homes and businesses. To ensure United States leadership, we need to foster a regulatory environment that encourages innovation and guarantees that the reliable services they provide remain available to combat bad actors seeking to undermine our national interest. This subcommittee is at the forefront 
of protecting and enhancing technological innovation in the United States. We're responsible for overseeing the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, and the National Telecommunications Information Administration, NTIA. In recent years, the satellite marketplace has seen a surge of investment because of a combination of lower launch cost to innovations that have made satellites more affordable, reliable, and available. Some estimates show that the space industry could triple to a $1.4 trillion market within a decade. The FCC has received dozens of applications for new NGSO satellite systems, indicating that the industry is ready to lead in this space. American satellite operators are providing in-home broadband at faster speeds than ever before, as well as key voice and data services to these industries and the federal government. Both long-standing operators and newer entrants have made or announced significant investments in next-generation systems. It's been far too long since Congress reassessed the role of satellite technology in the communications marketplace and whether or not our regulatory environment encourages investment in innovation in the space economy or hampers it. Today's hearing is the first step in what will be a robust effort to evaluate the state of the satellite marketplace. Many existing and proposed satellite systems raise novel questions about the use of space and spectrum that the FCC's rules do not address. For example, large non-geostationary orbit or NGSO satellite systems use spectrum more intensely than other types of satellite systems. These NGSO systems are required to share spectrum, and the rules that govern <coughs> sharing will be a critical ingredient to their success. Moreover, the satellite marketplace is global. Operators from around the world need to be able to license in many different regions, including the United States. Because of the global nature of the satellite industry, we need to consider international considerations of the use of spectrum, as well as uh, the other re or resources that are unique to the industry. We must lead in this industry, and we must ensure that our regulations encourage this innovation rather than stifle it. I look forward to hearing more from our witnesses. Thank you all for being here, for taking the time to share your insights, and I <clears throat> want to hear how this committee can be a partner to promote U.S. leadership, competition, and innovation in the satellite communications. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. The general lady yields back, and at this time, the chair recognizes the ranking member of the, of the full committee, the gentleman from New Jersey, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lada. Um, and let me thank you and a ranking member, Matsui. Uh, this is the first hearing of the subcommittee, and I'm certainly looking forward to working together, we have a long tradition of working in a bipartisan fashion to enhance technological innovation in this country, and this hearing marks the start of another endeavor. Today we begin exploring the next frontier of the commercial space industry. Um, let me say our committee can and should play an important role in shaping how the Federal Communications Commission regulates and licenses this sector and the airwaves that satellites use. I also want to commend uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and her fellow commissioners for recognizing the change in dynamics in the satellite industry and the need for the FCC to keep up with the times. The recent unanimous order adopting Chairwoman Rosenworcel's proposal to create a space bureau is an important step in the right direction and reflects the increasing importance of this industry in our communications marketplace. In the last few years, we've seen significant advancements in the ability of satellites to provide broadband internet and other critical services to consumers throughout the country and the world. And while this is beneficial for many reasons, it's especially helpful to those living in areas where other types of technologies haven't been built yet to reach consumers due to geographic considerations and other factors. Congress took a historic step forward last year by making a $65 billion investment in broadband connectivity as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. As a result of this new law, Americans across the nation who have lacked connectivity will finally be connected to high-speed, reliable, and affordable broadband. And this will make a huge difference for communities all across the nation that have been left behind for far too long. Satellites will also continue to play a role in competing with and enhancing the redundancy of terrestrial networks, including by expanding the coverage of mobile service. So I actually expect the consumer use of satellites to grow in the future as wireless carriers and phone manufacturers continue to build this capability into their networks and phones. 
Fortunately, with this technology, mobile consumers can rest assured that if they find themselves in an area without service, whether it's because of the lack of coverage, the result of natural disaster, or some other reason, they will continue to have the ability to reach first responders and loved ones during their time of need. And this additional layer of protection is a welcome sign, given that the climate crisis is causing more frequent and more severe disasters. Mobile service is essential to receive emergency alerts and life-saving information. In fact, a recent article detailed the devastating consequences that local communities and individual neighborhoods face when they lack access to mobile service in times of tragedy. These examples and so many others demonstrate that a resilient communications network can be the difference between life and death when the unexpected strikes. And satellite systems will be crucial in helping consumers navigate through these challenging moments. Now, the stakes could not be higher for the American satellite marketplace. Other countries, including our foreign adversaries, are making aggressive moves to dominate this industry, quite simply failing to ensure that the United States remains a market leader in this sector, risks our nation falling behind our counterparts across the globe, including China, in producing cutting-edge consumer innovations and fortifying our public safety and national security capabilities. It's also imperative that we protect the satellite marketplace and its relevant supply chains from threats by non-trusted actors. We can't risk having our satellite networks face the same challenges we have seen in some of our other communication networks, especially given the global nature of their operation. And it's important that we better understand this marketplace so that we can make sure that the American public benefits from these technological advancements in a safe and secure manner. And since satellite innovation is happening as we speak, we must begin examining this industry now so that the United States can prepare for the satellite technologies of today and tomorrow. So it's, a clear, we, it's clear we have a lot to discuss this morning. That's why this, this hearing is important. And as, you, as we continue to explore the growing satellite marketplace, and I just welcome our panelists, look forward to hearing from all of you and yield back the balance of my time, uh, Chairman Lana. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. We have now concluded with member opening statements. The chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. Again, we would like to thank all of our witnesses for being with us today and again, taking time to travel to DC to be with us and testify before the subcommittee. Today's witnesses will each have five minutes to provide an opening statement, which will be followed by a round of questions from our members. Our witness panel for today's hearing will include Mr. Tom Straub, President of the Satellite Industry Association, Ms. Julie Zoller, Head of the Global Regulatory Affairs with Project Kipper at Amazon, Ms. Jennifer Manor, Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at, uh, at Ecostar, uh, Ecostar excuse me, Corporation, Ms. Marco Deckard, Co-Founder and Chief Operating Officer of Link, of Link Global, Global, and Ms. Carrie Bingham, Director of Aerospace Security Projects and Senior Fellow at the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic International Studies. And um, as we begin, uh, just pr pull that microphone close to you uh, as we begin. And hopefully they got all of the technical difficulties taken care of before the committee started. But if not, we'll just switch boxes around here real quick. Okay. But uh, you'll notice that uh, there's the three lights there. So at 30 seconds, the yellow light will go on. And then at, uh, the, at, at five minutes, the red light will go on. So if you, at that point, please fi uh, follow, uh, finish up your statement. And uh, Mr. Straub, we will, uh, you are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. And again, thanks for being with us. Chairman Latta, Ranking Member Matsui, Chair Rogers, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. I'm Tom Straub, President of the Satellite Industry Association. Satellites are the backbone of modern technology. We rely on them for communications, position, navigation, and timing, and remote sensing across the globe. In addition to the vast range of services offered by the industry today, the companies represented by SIA are poised to lead the U.S. into an interconnected and data-driven future. We are at a time of tremendous innovation in the space industry, with over 7,000 active satellites on orbit today and plans of tens of thousands more through the end of the decade. Americans have long relied upon satellites to provide direct-to-home TV, satellite radio, and distribution of programming to cable companies as well as to TV and radio broadcasters. 
The satellite industry provides FCC to find broadband service across the globe and is prepared to bring the furthest corners of America into the 21st century by serving as the most viable technology capable of bridging the digital divide into rural areas. The industry is also working to bring the nation into an interconnected future as a backbone for 5G, IoT, and AI technologies. Satellites today provide anytime, anywhere global connectivity to consumers, utilities, the maritime industry, airlines, and unmanned aerial vehicles. Geospatial satellite data has not only transformed environmental monitoring, but also provides essential business analytics from monitoring remote infrastructure to analyzing supply chain performance. In addition, satellites play a critical role in preparation, response, and recovery from national disasters. Unlike terrestrial communication counterparts, satellite networks are not susceptible to damage from such catastrophes because the primary repeaters are on board the spacecraft and not part of the ground infrastructure. Remote sensing data and analytics can also help pinpoint where damage has occurred and what routes to the location are still accessible. Furthermore, synthetic aperture radar satellites can see through clouds and allow the mapping of damaged regions when storms are still overhead. Satellite technology is transforming agriculture across America as well. Satellite broadband enables remote farms with livestock sensors, soil monitors, and autonomous farming equipment in rural America, far beyond where terrestrial wireless and wireline can reach or make economic sense to deploy. Precision GPS technologies allow farmers to increase crop yield, and earth imaging satellites provide high-resolution imaging that allows them to determine when to plant, water, or fertilize crops. Satellites are not only a core technology for our domestic future, but also play a crucial role for advancing our national security priorities and partnerships abroad. Satellite communications have been a lifeline in Ukraine, and Earth imaging satellites have been a game changer in providing near real-time transparency into the Russian invasion of Ukraine. While the U.S. has long led the space sector, China trails close behind, with similar investments in space technologies that not only will be transformative in times of conflict, but also undermine international democracy. China is investing in navigation, communications, and remote sensing systems to rival the U.S. It is critical for Congress to support continued domestic innovation and avoid regulations that put U.S. providers on an unequal playing field internationally. The U.S. satellite industry is set to revolutionize daily life as we move into a more interconnected world where change on Earth is more visible than ever before. In order to ensure the success of the U.S. satellite industry, both domestically and globally, the industry needs these four things. First, assured access to spectrum that enables these technologies from communications frequencies to remote sensing data downlinks. Second, technology-inclusive policies allowing for innovative solutions across domains to address America's most challenging needs, including the provision of broadband services at the most affordable rates. Third, Adequate funding for government agencies responsible for oversight and licensing of the industry to enable them to keep up with the rapid pace of growth in the sector. And finally, a level playing field with international competitors, including the removal of satellite technologies from restrictive export control regulation when international commercial alternatives exist. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much for your statement. And Ms. Zoller, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lata, Ranking Member Matsui, Chair McMorris-Rogers, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Julie Zoller, Head of Global Regulatory Affairs for Amazon's Project Kuiper. Project Kuiper is our initiative to increase global broadband access through a constellation of 3,236 satellites in low Earth orbit, or LEO. Our mission is to deliver fast, affordable broadband to unserved and underserved communities in the United States and around the world. We are proud to advance the space and satellite capabilities of the United States, and we appreciate the work by this committee, the Federal Communications Commission, and the whole of government to maintain the strong U.S. leadership in these areas. Amazon is built around three big ideas, customer obsession, long-term thinking, and a willingness to invent. And Kuiper is an example of how we bring these principles to life. 
Amazon made a commitment of more than $10 billion to Project Kuiper, and we've continued to invest in the infrastructure, people, and technology to deliver on that vision. Since day one, we've been dedicated to space safety and sustainability. These values have influenced the overall architecture of our constellation, the design of our satellites, and our operations. It's an exciting time to be at Kuiper, and the team is making incredible progress. We've made major breakthroughs in customer terminals, which are high-performing, affordable, and smaller and lighter than legacy designs. We will soon launch our first two prototype satellites, allowing us to prove our technology, including networking and subsystems, as we prepare for full-scale deployment. We also announced the largest commercial procurement of launch vehicles in history to deploy our constellation. These launch agreements will support thousands of suppliers and skilled jobs across 49 states in the United States and at least 13 countries in Europe, paving the way for new production and launch infrastructure. Importantly, these agreements promote American leadership in launch services for the foreseeable future. U.S. companies are leading the unprecedented growth in the satellite industry, and this rapid increase has strained the regulatory framework. For its part, on a bipartisan basis, the FCC is working to update its rules to promote innovation, allocate more spectrum, and provide greater clarity for spectrum sharing. Amazon applauds the FCC's response to the needs of the satellite industry. Additionally, satellite systems are inherently international, and many of the international telecommunications. That is why at the upcoming World Radio Communication Conference, it is essential that the U.S. set forth priorities to ensure that the rules for LEO systems and satellites more generally support the success of this U.S.-led industry. Satellite technology is advancing rapidly, and LEO systems will benefit customers across the globe. Congress and the FCC can safeguard this progress and ensure American leadership within this industry. Congressional attention on these matters, like today's hearing, ensures the regulatory process supports continued innovation and increases opportunities to provide satellite broadband. Thank you again to the committee for focusing on satellite policy and understanding that it's critical to get U.S. policy right. I look forward to your questions and appreciate the opportunity to share our views. Thank you. Ms. Manor, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Rogers, Ranking Member Pallone, Chairman Lada, Ranking Member, member Matsui, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify on behalf of Echo Star Corporation, where I'm Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs. I'm excited to share my views on the dynamic satellite market and what needs to be done to strengthen American leadership in this global industry. One area the U.S. satellite industry excels is the provision of broadband satellite services. This service is critical to having cost-effective and timely solutions to solve the digital divide. However, there are some hurdles. First, the uncertain time frames associated with the FCC licensing process. America cannot lead if applications pile up at the FCC. We are hopeful that the FCC's recent hiring of more personnel and the creation of the Space Bureau will help. But we ask Congress to ensure that adequate funding be made available to ensure the FCC has the required resources. There should also be FCC guidelines to improve processing times. Similarly, it's critical that technology inclusiveness govern broadband policies, including grant funding. Satellites provide cost-effective broadband services where it's too expensive or impossible to deploy terrestrial infrastructure, yet some broadband funding programs are essentially closed to satellite operators. Accordingly, in order to ensure all Americans have broadband, the government should ensure that grant programs en enable the use of satellite broadband technology. Another area that needs to be addressed is the increased need for spectrum and long-term certainty necessary to support the large CapEx and OpEx requirements of satellite networks. Increased spectrum sharing is one solution. 
However, there are challenges as we enable more sharing in the fixed satellite service bands unless certain principles are adhered to. First, there must be good faith domestic coordination among systems. Second, there must be long-term certainty for operators for access to spectrum. If these costly systems do not have long-term spectrum access, it may be impossible for operators to obtain the funding required to support these networks, stifling U.S. innovation. Further, any sharing solution must consider the full operating parameters of these systems, including the aggregate interference environment. If such interference environment issues are not addressed, systems could face harmful interference degrading service to users. It's also important that before allowing the use of terrestrial spectrum by satellite systems, there's proof that in-band and adjacent services will not suffer harmful interference. Failure to do so could result in a repeat of what we saw years ago with garage door openers interfering into military communications. While some frequency bands can be successfully shared, this is not true for mobile satellite service bands. Exciting uses of the MSS bands, such as IoT and directed device services, are happening because of advances in technologies and the development of standards. MSS operators, like cell phone companies that operate in exclusive spectrum, are widely deployed and utilize omnidirectional antennas. Therefore, it's not possible for MSS operators to share spectrum with one another without suffering harmful interference. Additionally, as demand for satellite services increase, additional spectrum must be provided. The government must prioritize this effort as well. Of equal importance is including satellite technologies and standards developments. It's taken over a decade for satellite to be included in 3GPP standards. We're at an important juncture now as we further advance the inclusion of satellite in 5G and 6G standards at 3GPP and at the ITU. Accordingly, the, uh, the U.S. government as a participant, it's critical that it support the U.S. satellite industry. Finally, I'd like to call attention to the upcoming 2023 World Radio Conference and other ITU work. If the U.S. is going to prioritize domestically American satellite leadership, it must continue the support at the ITU. We're at the most exciting time in the satellite industry in our lifetimes. Satellite communications is poised to become a day-to-day -day presence. It's critical that the subcommittee takes a leadership role in this area and fosters an environment that enables the U.S. to continue to revolutionary, revolutionize this very important sector. EchoStar is committed to working with Congress the FCC and the administration to advance policies that facilitate the U.S. leadership in the satellite marketplace. By taking the lead now, the U.S. can be sure of continued leadership, not just now, but also in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions. All right, and again, thank you very much for your testimony. And Ms. Deckard, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Well, you want to pull your microphone right up to you there? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair McMorris-Rogers, Ranking Member Pallone, Chairman Lada, and Ranking Member Matsui, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to join this important conversation. My name is Margot Deckard, and I am a co-founder and chief operating officer of Link Global. I'm a systems engineer and a retired first responder, and I've spent the past three decades working in the humanitarian, defense, and space sectors. I am pleased to share Link's story with you, not only because Link, our story highlights um, the new space revolution, but it also highlights the need for our government to support this revolution in order for America to lead. Link was born from the work that I did in the 2014 Ebola pandemic crisis response in Liberia and Sierra Leone. While looking at began terminals that were deployed to forward field hospitals, I noticed that most of these video sat terminals were only utilized for texting. Think about the information that can be conveyed in a text. Infection rates, fatalities, supply requests. Think about the time saved if a team just has to grab their phone and their go bag and respond to a crisis. It is very clear that the terminal is the problem. It has to be the device already in everybody's pocket, the one they can afford. So together with my fellow co-founders, we invented cell towers in space that connect to that device already in your pocket. We are the world's only patented, proven from orbit, and commercially licensed by the FCC satellite direct-to-phone system. As of January 3rd, we have three cell towers in space, including the first 5G-enabled payload. 
We're testing in 18 countries on all seven continents. With $2.5 billion in contracts, we're going to begin international intermittent commercial service in April. Link partners with mobile network operators. They bring the spectrum and the customers, and we bring the infrastructure to fill in their coverage gaps, extend their coverage, or provide their network resiliency. We do this by taking the terrestrial base station and moving it onto our small satellites in low Earth orbit and solving for Doppler shift and the extended range time delay. That's our patented secret sauce. We are a proud American company. We were invented and built in the United States. Companies like Link need a responsive and timely regulatory process in order to succeed and in order to keep America at the forefront. Satellite direct to phone is now a category and it's a category that it's imperative for the United States to own. Like many new space companies, Link is fundamentally different than old space companies. We're leaner and more agile. In fact, our first payload went from a drawing on a napkin to flying in space in six months. Supporting new space companies, protecting their intellectual property and speed to market is absolutely critical for American leadership because foreign governments will not slow down their companies. We can end digital poverty with this technology. Just like the printing press brought knowledge to the masses, so does connectivity provide quality of life, education, participation in a global society and economy, and resiliency. I'd like to share with you a personal story that really highlights the potential benefits of this technology. When I was a paramedic, I ran at, I, in an earl, a rural area near Xenia, Ohio. In 2000, my community got hit by a tornado, and my neighbor tragically was in his barn when the tornado demolished it. My neighbor's wife and I dug him out of the barn with our bare hands. And miraculously, some kid in a red pickup truck showed up and offered to take him to the nearest hospital. Now, when you get to that end of that street, you can turn right to Green Memorial Hospital or you can turn left to Miami Valley Hospital. Which way to turn? I was about to guess at a life and death decision. What I would have given for a satellite to fly overhead and transmit a text to first responders, green, not accepting patients, Highway 35 open to the valley, to the device that is always with me. Link can do that today. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to the dialogue. And thank you very much for your testimony. And Ms. Bingham, you are recognized for five minutes. All right, thank you, uh, Chairman Lada, Ranking Member Matsui, Chairwoman Rogers, and Ranking Member Pallone, subcommittee. Uh, members as well. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Uh, CSIS does not take policy positions, so, so the views here are my own. Uh, let me start with three main points. One, we are witnessing technology and economic trends in the satellite marketplace that make this time different than before and leave me bullish on the viability of the commercial space sector and its impact. Two, foreign competition, especially from China, is intensifying. China is coming after our lead and they don't play by our rules. Three, our leadership in space isn't guaranteed, nor is it a lost cause. I believe there are steps the government can take with urgency and purpose to keep that lead, including in regulatory and export policy reforms. It is an exciting time to be in the space community. The commercial space sector is flourishing with new technology, innovative solutions, and talented entrepreneurs. A few to highlight. The diffusion of space technology is lowering the barrier to entry, seen in the proliferation of small satellites, once the size of buses, now the size of shoeboxes that can be developed and launched for a few million dollars. The commercialization of space capabilities that were once reserved for nation states is enabling a wider range of uses and greater transparency. For example, commercial satellite data is being used to detect illegal fishing to understand the impacts of Arctic ice cap melt and to monitor gas pipelines and oil storage inventories. The convergence of space sensor data, artificial intelligence, and global networks 
is enabling the fusion of large data sets with analytic insights that can be delivered anywhere on the globe. Private capital. 2021 was a record-setting year for private capital invested in the commercial space sector. This presents an opportunity for government users to leverage space services developed with private capital to help meet their mission needs. Speed. I spent my career in national security space, and I was conditioned to expect satellites to be delivered and fielded in about 10 years or more. In contrast, there's one commercial satellite operator today that's outputting six to seven satellites per day off its production line. While all of these trends benefit U.S. space companies, they also apply to the foreign space landscape. The global space ambitions of Beijing in particular are the most consequential to our national and economic security. Chinese President Xi Jinping has, art has articulated a space dream to make China the foremost space power by 2045. China's increasingly robust space capabilities include advanced navigation, communications, intelligence, missile warning, in-space logistics, and space situational awareness. It is also pursuing an arsenal of counter space weapons that would deny our use of space assets. We can no longer assume that we lead in all areas of space. For example, in 2021, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency assessed that China was the global leader in three of nine categories of commercial space-based imagery capabilities. U.S. commercial providers maintained the lead in only three. A particularly acute area of space competition is in commercial SATCOM, which CSIS recently examined in a study on low Earth orbit broadband networks that I commend to your reading. These constellations offer a compelling solution for bridging the digital divide, specifically for rural and underserved communities, as nearly 40% of the world's population and 28% of rural households in America remain unconnected. China's global space objectives, including a planned LEO broadband network, have been incorporated into its Digital Silk Road initiative. However, this expanding space network comes at a price. Foreign customers of Chinese LEO broadband services should assume that their data will be sent to Beijing and that Beijing will surveil users and block internet access at will. After all, China has, an, has a national intelligence law that requires organizations and citizens to support intelligence work and to keep it secret. So let me offer a few recommendations that can help maintain U.S. leadership in space and position U.S. companies to retain their competitive advantage. Make simple changes in regulatory licensing processes, such as establishing defined timelines and opening communication channels with companies. Revisit technology export control policies, ITAR specifically, that are hindering space cooperation with our allies and, with our allies and partners who we will need to successfully compete. Take a leadership role in key international coordination bodies. A U.S. person is taking on leadership of the ITU after eight years of Chinese leadership. Seek greater adoption and integration of commercial space capabilities and services to support mission needs. Finally, the Department of Commerce in 2018 was given responsibility to provide basic safety services to commercial space operators and the public. Uh, I would encourage Commerce to be forward-leaning in executing and resourcing these efforts within their Office of Space Commerce. Thank you again for the time today, and I look forward to your questions. And again, thank you to all of our witnesses today for your <laughs> statements. We greatly appreciate it here on the Energy and Commerce Committee and in, in hearing what you're saying today. We look over the horizon five to 10 years because that's where you all are. And so to get the right legislation and the regulations in place, we need to hear from you. So we appreciate you being here today. I will, this begins our questions uh, from our members, and I will begin the questioning and recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Straub, in your, your uh, statement, you speak of the state of the satellite industry. Uh, what, what do you see as some of the greatest challenges of the industry that's facing you at this time? Thank you for the question. I think that the four primary challenges that the industry facing are continued access to spectrum. All of the services that we've talked about rely on spectrum, a resource, but uh, we cannot continue to grow without access to spectrum. The next is a, a stable regulatory environment and sufficient resources uh, for those organizations that oversee the industry. Geostationary satellites are expected to have a lifespan of 15 to 20 years. Non-geostationary constellations often cost five to $10 billion to deploy. And so having a stable regulatory environment to ensure that uh, the rules don't change uh, during the lifespan of uh, a satellite or a constellations is important. Um, we commend the FCC for their plans to uh, create a space bureau and the increased resources that have been made available 
to address the tremendous number of applications that uh, have been filed, but continued, uh, continued resources for the FCC and other, other, over, uh, other oversight organizations is important. Um, space sustainability is important. Um, you know, the, given the tremendous increase in the number of satellites, knowledge of where they are and other objects in space is important. Uh, and we're happy to see the Office of Space Commerce funded to be able to put together a space situational awareness uh, capability. And then finally, something that I think that uh, most of the speakers today have touched upon is international competition, especially as a potential um, uh, restrictions on U.S. companies that might not, might not apply to our international competitors. Well, thank, thank you very much. Ms. Manor, you have extensive experience working with the FCC to authorize the various systems and services that Hughes uh, Echo Star provides. What is the FCC's current role in licensing satellite systems and what information they consider when approving a license request? Oh, if you'd uh, turn your speaker on, thank you. Sorry, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Um, so the FCC process, and I'm focused not on small sats, we're not a small sat provider today, but generally is information about ITU filings, information on spectrum, technical characteristics and operational parameters, an orbital debris plan showing compliance with the rules and waivers. But I wanted to bring up three areas that I wanted to highlight, which I think do hurt American competitiveness in the FCC's application process. The first is the limits on the number of ITU filings and the timing for ITU filings that US systems can be made through the FCC. Unfortunately, today, most countries allow, allow unfettered ITU filings or with very little limits. The FCC has very strict restrictions. This often sh uh, causes US operators to go forum shopping for other nations in which to file their systems to. Another area of concern is bonds. Um, the FCC in the early 2000s came up with the concept to, to reduce speculation to impose a bond requirement on satellite systems. Unfortunately, that does hamper the ability of operators to go through the US for licensing. And the third area I'd like to highlight, which is an area under consideration in FCC rulemaking right now, is the number of unbuilt systems that one operator could have. So I think improvements in the licensing process in these three areas would be particularly helpful as well to encourage US leadership in satellite licensing and satellite systems. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Deckard, uh, it's important as Congress examines its laws and conducts oversight of agency regulations to understand where the market is heading. Uh, could you describe some of the services that Link offers right now or plans to offer the United States? And I've only got about a minute left. So thank you. Thank you. So Link currently offers texting and emergency cell broadcast services internationally. We're licensed internationally, so we don't currently offer those services in the U.S., but we do test them here. We are on a path to provide broadband by 2025 as we build out our constellation from the initial 10 satellites, which are authorized under the small sat authorization, to our full constellation, which will be about 5,000 satellites. And, and what's that timeline again on that, please? 2025, we'll be able to support broadband. And we're actually launching international service in April. So as soon as we have an MNO partner here in the US and we can go back to the FCC and ask for market access, then we will be able to provide those services here in the U.S. Well, thank you very much. And again, uh, thanks to our witnesses. And at this time, I'll yield back and recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the general lady from California, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The global uh, satellite marketplace is growing increasingly competitive. For the U.S. to remain the pace setter in this technology, it's vital that our rules provide incentives for U.S. companies to seek licenses here. As we review the rules for U.S. licenses and requests for market access, we have a chance to reinforce U.S. leadership. Ms. Zoller and Ms. Bingham Gillen, uh, just a quick yes or no. Do you believe FCC rules should incentivize operators to seek a U.S. license rather than choosing a foreign government certification with lower requirements whenever appropriate? Just yes or no, Ms. Zoller and Ms. Bingham? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, to keep the satellite marketplace dynamic, we need to strike the right balance between protecting incumbent operations and creating room for new entrants to compete. To this end, I sent a letter to Chairwoman Rosenworcel urging her to balance the goals of new entry market 
with certain protections of existing operators. Ms. Soller, do you think it's possible to strike this balance and what regulatory tools could be used to keep the market innovative? Thank you for that question. Yes, I do think it's possible to achieve that balance. One of the most important things in that regard is to have clear sharing rules for spectrum, sharing between non-geostationary systems, as well as between non-geostationary and other satellite systems. Thank okay. you. Thank you. The FCC has made important progress on increasing technical coordination between system operators. I recently sent Chairman Rosenworth a letter urging her to institute continuous and flexible information sharing requirements to help achieve cooperation. Ms. Zoller, again, can you describe the role of coordination between operators and the specific type of technical information that could support satellite coexistence? Coordination between operators involves sharing information about their satellite network design, the constellation design, the plans for service areas, and the plans for when they're going to transmit to where. So that kind of information sharing so that you know the difference, especially if you're a low Earth orbiting system mm -hmm. like Kuiper, you know when a satellite is going to transmit to a particular point on the Earth, you're able to know if there's really a potential for interference or not a potential for inf okay. interference. So information sharing is important. Thank you very much. My new district uh, now includes areas with a rich tradition of agriculture stretching back generations. Like any other small business, these family farms are always looking for ways to innovate and improve their yields. Ms. Manor, can you describe the role of IoT in precision agriculture and how satellite service could support this technology? Thank you very much for the question. Um, so first off, satellite is one of a solution, one of many solutions. You have, um, of course, fiber, terrestrial wireless, fixed wireless. Satellites particularly good in rural areas, which are part of your district, um, where you can use satellites for everything from monitoring, you know, the level of moisture in the ground to um, working with your tractors and other farm equipment to, to either ensure navigation if you need broadband. Um, you could download maps and other information. So it has a wide variety of uses. It can also connect all the devices in a farm. And when you're talking about larger farms, um, that are a conglomerate of different farms. You can also share information among each other, which is something that we've seen been okay. done. Thank you. As a co-chair of the Spectrum Caucus, I understand the increasing demand for Spectrum across all industries. As we look to the future, the satellite industry, like other wireless communication industries, will need to find ways to be more efficient with the Spectrum it has to accommodate more users. Ms. Dollar, what technologies are available today to improve Spectrum efficiency and what could be done in the future? Thank you for the question. LEO systems are uniquely suited for spectrum efficiency because many satellites are visible to a given point on the Earth. And also the ability to use small beams mm -hmm. enables LEO systems to reuse spectrum intensively. Okay. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, for being here today, and I'm sure we'll be speaking with you more often. Thank you. Yield back. The gentlelady yields back, and at this time, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from Washington, the chair of the floor committee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Energy and Commerce Committee has been a long leader in advancing 5G, autonomous vehicles, and other advanced technologies. In each of these areas, Competitors like China have sought to undermine U.S. leadership in developing and deploying these services, like the planned 13,000 satellite Starnet constellation. Ms. Bingen, there you are. What are the greatest threats to the United States in space, and how should we be thinking about these national security issues in the satellite communications industry? Okay, no, th thank you for that question, uh, Madam Chair. So I look at threats to U.S. space capabilities in two ways. One is security and one is economic. So on the security front, 
our adversaries know how important space is, not just to our daily lives, to our financial transactions, but to how our military fights wars. We cannot project power overseas without relying on space capabilities, navigation, communications, et cetera. They know how valuable that is, and they are developing weapons to deny our use of that. We've actually seen it in Ukraine, so this is not a hypothetical, where Russia, early in the conflict, sought to target uh, commercial communication satellites, sought to, to deny GPS uh, as well. Um, on the economic front, we are clearly in a technology and a space race with China, and President Xi has made it very clear with top-down direction, um, uh, he's prioritized aerospace as a technology area, um, there are massive private and public sector investments, and they've given uh, their companies quite a bit of leeway. So um, what I think is interesting here is in the past, gover our, our government has led in this area, and now it is really the commercial sector leading the way. And where that economic and that um, security piece come together for me is you know, our military has long relied on a technology advantage. Mm -hmm. As that advantage is starting to close, I I'm concerned about our military advantage eroding as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ms. D uh, Zoller, the, the satellite industry has seen significant growth and change in the last several years. Amazon Kuiper is one example of a company that's innovative and saw an opportunity to enter the marketplace as a new operator. Would you speak to us about your experience getting Project Kuiper licensed and what have been some of the biggest challenges you've faced through the process? Thank you for the question. Our experience has been positive. We received our license to launch and operate the Kuiper Constellation in July of 2020. And just in December of 2022, we received our experimental license to launch the two prototype satellites that are going up in the, in the coming months. The issues are really complex, um, but the FCC is helping with that by initiating spectrum sharing procedures, and procedures to make more spectrum available to non-geostationary satellite systems like ours. Thank you. Ms. Manor, you offer many uh, different services from fixed satellite service that provides in-home broadband to mobile satellite service that provides highly reliable voice or data services to utilities or the transportation sector. Given that these services transcend national borders, can you speak to us about how these services are coordinated globally? Thank you. It's complex. Um, we start with having the required ITU filings. That's where everything starts, and having to coordinate our systems internationally. And then we go down to market access. And market access will include different rules for different services. And it may also result in conflicting coordination requirements um, just yesterday, we announced a new LEO system, MSS, and just looking at the three largest markets in the Americas, the U.S., Brazil, and Canada, we will be subject possibly to three different coordination requirements of our system. So not only do we have the ITU coordination requirements, we have those of um, individual countries. So one thing that would be helpful is if we had a single international regime that all countries used as opposed to a patchwork, but we still have the patchwork with the market access. Um, and then standards is the third portion of this. And one of the things we're very proud of was being a leader at 3GPP and in getting satellite included in the 3GPP standards, which creates global ecosystems and gives signals to countries on where to allow certain technologies. So, so we think that helps our market access as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and thank you again, everyone, for, for being here, sharing your insights. I, I yield back. Well, thank you very much. The general lady yields back, and at this time, the chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Latta. I mentioned earlier that I'm interested in how new and novel satellite technologies can bridge the connectivity gap during natural disasters like hurricanes and wildfires, because these events have a strong track record of bringing down our communications infrastructure for extended periods. And we have to consider how innovation in this area can help reduce the number and lengths of outages that our communities have to deal with at the time they're perhaps most in need of a connection to call a first responder or a loved one or to get life-saving emergency items. So I wanted to get one question into Ms. Decker and another to Ms. Bing. And let me start with Ms. Decker. Can you describe how satellite-based services like those offered by Link 
can ensure that our ability to reach emergency services in times of disaster are not interrupted, even if our traditional communications infrastructure is offline, and what has changed to make this service possible? And in your experience as a first responder, how can lives be saved by having this kind of network redundancy in place during emergencies? Thank you for the question. So, Link is a fundamental change in the way we deliver communications. First of all, by using UHF bands from space, we connect to that unmodified phone already in everyone's pocket. Because we move the terrestrial base station onto our small satellites in orbit, we aren't subject to the same perturbations that a terrestrial cell tower is subject to in a natural disaster or a fire. We don't melt and we don't get blown down. So we're that instantaneous backup. As long as our cell tower in space is overhead, we provide that seamless connectivity. In fact, during normal operations, the link cell tower is the weakest signal in the sky, and then when a customer moves out of their terrestrial coverage, our signal becomes the strongest and they seamlessly roam onto our network. That's true whether it's in normal operations or if our terrestrial partner's network goes down. In terms of the life-saving capabilities, I feel this is a sea change, not only for first responders, but for the communities that they serve. Communications is the most critical part in the chain of survival. You know, I, I think about the Garish Chung family every day. They perished in Sierra National Forest. Jonathan, Ellen, their baby girl and their dog died of heat exhaustion with texts queued up in their phone. With the link cell towers, that just won't happen. If you have a phone in your pocket, you'll be able to initiate that chain of survival and help yourself to be rescued. All right, well thank you. Now these last several years, there's been an ongoing conversation in Congress and across the government about how to support American innovation, particularly in the technology sector, and also to ensure that our communications networks and technology are not used by bad actors and our foreign adversaries to do harm. So Ms. Bingen, in your testimony, you note that in the aerospace sector, and I quote, Beijing's economic and industrial espionage against the U.S. continues to represent a significant threat to America's prosperity, security, and competitive advantage. So can you describe in greater detail why satellite technology poses that threat, and do you think it's important to ensure that satellite systems that are owned and operated by bad actors and foreign adversaries are prevented from either being licensed here in the U.S. or gaining access to U.S. markets? Th thank you, sir. I would say that, that Chinese vendors, and I would use ZTE and Huawei as examples, they do pose a significant risk to our security. They're subject to Chinese government controls, um, and China has made it very clear they're out to steal our technology and apply it to their, their, their military and to advancing their own, their own technology sector. Whether we're talking satellites or we're talking terrestrial communications infrastructure, if, if it's a Chinese system, if China built it, if they operated it, they now have the means and the access. They can build in back doors. Um, they have the means and access to, to block users' access to that network, um, to potentially censor content, to exfiltrate sensitive data, personal information, and bring that back to, to Beijing. Plus the ability, as you said, sir, to, to, to conduct espionage or possibly even sabotage. Um, an example of that is the, the African Union headquarters. Um, Beijing funded it, their, their state-owned enterprises uh, built it, um, and they operate the network. It was reported that for five years, um, that data from the African Union headquarters was being siphoned off and sent back to Beijing. So th that's why I say, I, you would, as a user of Chinese networks, you would have to assume that that was a possibility. All right, thank you so much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. And at this time, the chair will recognize members as they came in at the gavel. And at this time, the chair will recognize the gentleman from the second district of Florida for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panelists as well for their testimony. The United States literally must remain a global leader in innovative satellite technologies and communications. The federal government should play a supporting role and this by ensuring that the regulatory process does not inhibit innovation with overly board, burdensome regulations. This is why I reintroduced the Launches Act with my esteemed colleague from Florida, Congressman Soto. Uh, the Launches Act streamlines the bureaucratic elements of the rocket launching process, making it easier for 
private companies to obtain the uh, spectrum necessary for launches. I look forward to working with Congressman Soto, the members of the committee, and the entire House on the passage of this bill this session. Another goal that is particularly important to me is bringing rural broadband access to every square foot of the Florida panhandle. Uh, the ability to maintain internet access during and after natural disasters is vitally important to saving lives. We witnessed that firsthand after Hurricane Michael devastated the panhandle in 2018, taking out our communications. Satellite communications can play a really important role in that mission. Uh, so we need to ensure that the regulatory process supports the innovations happening at companies like yours and throughout the entire satellite industry. Mr. Stroop, <clears throat> I'm interested in hearing what the industry considers its most pressing issue right now. I believe the most pressing issue today, as it has been for some period of time, is access to spectrum, continued access to spectrum. 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 Very good. Good. You know, put a put a underline it. That's good. Uh, is there a feeling of uncertainty or hesitancy when your member members are working with uh, with uh, government? And, and is that an inhibition to innovation? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? So it means you, when your members are working with, with the FC, all the different government regulators that you have to work with, I mean, do they have a feeling they don't know exactly what it is that the regulators want? And does that inhibit them? So certainly regulatory uncertainty is an, is an issue. I mean, for example, a few years ago, we went through the Spectrum Frontiers proceeding where we had to start sharing spectrum with the terrestrial industry. That kind of uncertainty creates issues because they've launched satellites with certain capacity operating on certain frequencies that are no longer restricted. So I, that, that was one of the reasons for noting um, stability of, of regulation is an important issue for our members because it does continue to be an issue. I understand that. I just wanted to hear you say it because I, I know how important that is. We talk about spectrum a lot up here, but we don't seem to actually get to the end, end uh, the goal line very often. Uh, uh, Ms. Solar, from the perspective of the average consumer in rural America, what practical difference would a robust low earth orbit satellite communication system is broadly deployed. What, what are they going to see different on the ground? Thank you for that question. Kuiper is designed specifically to meet the needs of rural and remote citizens by providing high speed, affordable broadband access to communities that don't have the availability of traditional wired and wireless solutions. That just sort of describes the second district of Florida in a lot of locations. So uh, you know, we would love to see that. I can't tell you how many calls we get on that. A quick follow-up. In your testimony, you provided some comments on proposed rules and initiatives that the FCC is working on. Which of those items helps you to deploy faster? The rules on spectrum sharing between non-geostationary systems and understanding how later licensees need to protect earlier licensees. Greater clarity on that point. Thank you. So I'm detecting a, a, a common thread here, spectrum, spectrum, spectrum. And, and so I hope that we can actually solve this problem for you during this, uh, uh, this, this very productive congressional session that we plan to have. Uh, Chairman Lott, I, I uh, yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yield back the remainder of his time, and this time the chairman would recognize the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in Florida's 9th con Congressional District, looking from my backyard in Kissimmee, it's uh, quite a fascinating world. We uh, get to see rockets launch multiple times a week uh, from Cape Canaveral and my colleague Bill Posey's uh, district. Cape Canaveral's become the busiest spaceport in the world. Uh, and uh, 57 launches in 2022, and we're looking at 86 to 92 launches in 2023, according to the Space Force. Uh, very exciting area. My constituents get on that beach line every day and drive out to work for NASA, SpaceX, ULA, Blue Origin, uh, and many others. Uh, and uh, I'm proud to have launched the, uh, the Bipartisan Launch Communications Act with Dr. Dunn that we just filed yesterday. Uh, right now, you need a license for every launch. Uh, I applaud the FCC for establishing uh, a new rule for the 2200 to 2290 megahertz 
um, band, but it feels like it's still going a little slow compared to what we need. Uh, Mr. Shroop, how critical is it to streamline MCC applications for launches, including satellite launches? Streamlining is an extremely important issue to the industry. And uh, just as a matter of fact, we had a working group meeting yesterday to talk about additional recommendations that we can make to the commission for further streamlining. Um, so in terms of access to spectrum, whether it's for, for launch or whether it's for the operation of the satellites, um, it's extremely important. Um, the commission has taken some steps to further streamline the process, but we're looking forward to making additional recommendations on how they can further streamline it. You know, space flight, it, it literally is rocket science. So have you seen delays before because of not getting an application on time combined with weather and other factors uh, as a result of not of having to do an individual license? My understanding from some of our members is sometimes just before launch, um, they finally are able to get uh, an application granted. Again, the chairwoman noted the number of applications that they've received, the backlog of applications, which I believe is one of the reasons for restructuring the, the FCC to be able to address some of those issues. Thank you. And, and Ms. Zoller, we, we know that uh, satellite internet is, is one of the keys to the future in our nation. We, uh, I, I know the NTIA recently had made a ruling about the reliability threshold and that we need to, we need to get up there in a hurry with these satellites. Uh, and so achieving scale and, and competition is critical. We see Starlink has 3,500 satellites and counting. You all plan to start with 3,200, but are going to go beyond that too. So how do we help make sure we have multiple companies uh, and uh, maintain competition uh, so that we could get to that threshold with the 65 billion that we already have through the infrastructure law uh, to, to make sure that satellite can also qualify for that? Thank you for that, that question. It's important that the, the rules foster innovation and competition. We've received our license to launch Kuiper in 2020, and we've really made incredible progress with the $10 billion investment. We've continued to invest in infrastructure. We have employees in this Washington building our satellites right now. We announced the largest launch contract deals in history in April of last year, and we'll be launching our satellites in the near future. There'll be multiple winners in low Earth orbit to connect the unconnected, and I, I think you asked a really important question. Getting the rule set so that spectrum is available it's reliably available. We have consistency across the globe on spectrum access because satellite systems are inherently global in nature and that we have clear spectrum sharing rules because we're not up there alone. That's very helpful, Mrs. Zoller. We know uh, we want you all to get to the level like others, uh, the 65 billion in the infrastructure law was technology neutral, but there is uh, some work with the NTIA, and uh, we wish you all the best of luck in uh, scaling up so we could have multiple different ways for our constituents, particularly in rural areas of Florida, to be able to access internet. And I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. And at this time, the chair will recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lada, and Ranking Member Matsui for hosting today's hearing on the satellite marketplace and providing us with an opportunity to highlight the importance of this specific technology and its role for closing the digital divide and ensuring that all Americans have access to fast and reliable broadband. The topography of my congressional district calls for an all of the above approach for getting my constituents connected from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to Johnstown, Pennsylvania Satellite technology has the ability to reach those who are and were previously unreachable. I am interested to learn more about how members of this subcommittee can help to bolster the satellite industry and keep the United States as a leader and an innovator in this technology. 
We can't afford to fall behind our adversaries as we move further into the 21st century. My first question is for both Ms. Bingen and Mr. Straub. Ms. Bingen first. Who do you see as our biggest adversarial competitor when it comes to the satellite in industry? And what can we be doing to ensure that the United States remains that leader, that innovator for this technology? Great, thank you, sir. Uh, China, 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 China. Um, and then I'd say in, in terms of US leadership, um, our commercial space sector is is phenomenal. It is incredibly innovative. We have entrepreneurs that are really pushing the envelope. They are taking risks in areas that the government wouldn't. Um, what I would say there is, you know, we need to be able to get them on the playing field. So the regulatory issues that some of my colleagues here ha have have highlighted, um, uh, and having a more enabling regulatory environment to get them on the field, I think is really important. The other piece here is is the technology export control policies. Um, we're at a point where these companies are, these American businesses are offering a tremendous capability in data, imagery, et cetera, to our allies and partners who want to work with the US. The problem is, is those partners now have a choice. It's not just an American company going in there, it's a European competitor. it's China. When our, when our companies are hampered by, um, by long ITAR processes, um, ITAR processes that don't account for how quickly technology is moving, um, they are not as competitive internationally. And the result of that is now the US government has to be that anchor tenant and fund them as opposed to them getting diverse revenue from, from other sources. And I thank you. I share those concerns that our biggest adversary is China. Mr. Straub, would you weigh on this as well, please? I, I agree um, with make, this begins uh, comments, China. And one recommendation that I would make to help ensure a strong broadband industry in the United States is the application of technology neutral funding rules. Um, so for example, Congress has made a substantial amount of funding available to bring broadband to the country, across the country. There are areas where satellite is the most cost effective means of being able to provide that service and ensuring that satellite companies are eligible for that funding is a way of ensuring not only that Americans get access to that service, but also the health of the industry. Thank you. Ms. Deckard, you mentioned how currently you're planning to provide text services. Can you go into a bit of detail once those text services have been established and continue to evolve, what are the next expansions? What are the next steps that you're looking to take? Thank you for the question. So we are on a, a path to provide broadband and along that path as we build out the constellation and add satellites, we add services. So from texting and emergency cell broadcast, we move to supporting things like IP messaging, digital money, and all those things that especially our international market needs in order to thrive. And then we move to broadband in 2025 and support almost all the traditional services that you enjoy on your phone today. Thank you. My final question is for you, Ms. Zollner. How do you anticipate that Cooper can help get rural Americans like those who live in my district, connected. Do you anticipate offering home broadband services? Thank you for that question. Yes, we do. We anticipate serving households, businesses, schools, hospitals, government agencies, and other organizations in rural and, and underserved areas. I thank all of the witnesses for testifying here today. Your message is not lost on this subcommittee and I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and at this time, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think this is great that we're having this hearing today on next generation uh, satellites. Uh, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and uh, one of my top priorities here is obviously being able to uh, increase access to the internet, uh, and the affordability gap, which quite frankly impacts uh, all of our constituents in some form or fashion. Uh, and now as new technology develops and promises greater capabilities, there is optimism and opportunity to capitalize on these developments to help us reach the, connect the connectivity goals uh, that so many of us, if not all of us, uh, want to see happen in the 21st century. Uh, Mr. Srope, in your testimony, you mentioned the need for uh, technology-inclusive uh, policies uh, to address America's challenges regarding connectivity. Can you explain how the satellite industry 
uh, is helping identify the parts of the country that can benefit the most from a robust uh, investment in infrastructure and advanced technologies to help uh, close a lot of these gaps when it comes to accessibility to things like broadband? So we have here with me two companies that are providing broadband services, and there are several others. And a lot of the, the market opportunity is for those areas of the country that cannot receive any other signal. But one of the other things that I would note, in addition to providing service to those otherwise unserved areas, is the ability to provide competition for every other area where there is broadband service. Uh, there are multiple companies providing broadband service, um, as a satellite broadband service today, now in competition with whether they're fiber companies or other means of providing broadband service. So um, they are looking at every one of the opportunities to take advantage of the funding. Um, as I've noted, one of the concerns is that uh, it is not being applied in a technology neutral basis. Um, so um, the fact that we're deploying the, these technologies, we have multiple companies deploying the technologies, I think is gonna be one of the driver in ensuring that the services are available. No, thank you very much. Um, I was hoping uh, that someone could provide me, uh, Mr. Zoller, or I'm sorry, Ms. Zoller or, or Mr. Strope, can you provide an example of industry that's partnering with local organizations and schools uh, to raise awareness uh, about opportunities, uh, particularly in this, in this space? I know that that also is something that a lot of us are, are concerned about as we look at these achievement gaps, we look at you know, diversity, uh, in the workforce and people being able to deploy these. Can you talk about that a little bit, e either one of you? It, it, thank you for the question. In, in terms of uh, partnering with global organizations to make them aware of, uh, of opportunities, just as an example today, we are hosting, uh, SIA is hosting a delegation from the Bahamas on how we can help provide 5G infrastructure for the country. So that's an example of the global nature of the industry and things that uh, uh, that we're doing to help ensure uh, opportunities across the, the globe. <clears throat> Ms. Zoller. Thank you. Diversity and inclusion is an extremely important goal, uh, both from the perspective of, of how we're building the company, but also from the perspective of, of connectivity. One of the things that um, is important is STEM education and an emphasis on STEM education in early elementary school so that we can build that engineering talent to work on satellites like, Pro like Project Kuiper. Do you believe that there's a, a, a lack of interest uh, when it comes to STEM, uh, particularly when we talk about engineering and math, just because there are, you know, a lot of kids are intimidated. I know even my son is 16 years old. I know the one thing that is, physics teacher said at the very beginning of the year is that, you know, he doesn't want kids to see this as another intimidating math course. And so he's tried to, to, to really be creative in the curriculum. Do you think that there's a, a, an, an issue there when it comes to interest among uh, children when it comes to STEM and math related um, uh, subject matter? I can only speak from my own experience as, as an engineer and ha having seen fewer women enter the field I think there, there is an, an issue there. I've done tutoring for a, for a number of years, and my focus area in my tutoring work has always been math and science and helping, helping kids connect to the possibilities that those careers provide and to, to be a real-life example of that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time, and at this time, the chair will recognize the gentleman from Texas's 14th district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, panel, for being here. Uh, I guess I'm going to address this first one. Is it to Stroop? Is that how you say your name? Straup. Straup. That was my next guest. Um, how is the access to spectrum, which was a major concern pretty much everybody voiced, how is that protected? Well, frequency, frequency bands are allocated for specific purposes. Right, and I realize there's a part of the spectrum that's low frequency and there's ultra high frequency, there's very high frequency, but what prevents somebody like China from using all that up? There are international coordination, or there's an international coordination organization that is responsible for that. Um, certainly there's a, a desire to avoid interference because ultimately 
Um, if you're interfering with one, one country's allocation, you're potentially going to have uh, um, a distorted service, I guess it would be the best example. But there's an international, the ITU is responsible for international coordination. So whoever wins the widest bandwidth and that allocation wins the satellite war. That I think it would certainly provide an advantage. I mean, there are other issues associated with success in the industry, but having access to more spectrum than a competitor would provide you an advantage. How do we prevent that? I'm sorry? How do we prevent that? I think that the United States taking a unified position before the WRC is one of the, the strongest ways to achieve Yeah, and I don't mean to sound, uh, <clears throat> I guess, well, maybe I do, pessimistic, but... Do we really expect China to play by those rules? Does China play by the rules? Well, I, I, certainly we've seen that they do not play by the rules in many areas. So again, how do we, how do we protect that? I, again, I'm sorry to come back to the same answer, but ensuring that the United States has a unified position, promoting the satellite industry as part of the objectives. It, it's a real problem, isn't it? Would the rest of the panel agree it's uh, making sure that China abides by those rules will be a real problem? Um, does the FCC monitor that closely what China is doing in the spectrum, or any other country for that matter? Do we know? They do not monitor that. That's encouraging. And I'm, I'm going to move over to the link now, if I can, with a question for you. Um, when you've got phone service that are going to different countries and stuff, it looks like from your website you have about 100,000 customers currently. No, we... Um we have deals with 26 mobile network operators around the world that represent billions of Oh, is that right? Customers. Okay, well, I must have not read closely enough or deeply enough. Does the caller ID come across international around the world? I'm sorry, sir. Can you when, when, you, when somebody calls, do, you, do they see the caller ID? Um, what do you mean by caller ID? Well, the network that they in other words, I need to know my wife's calling because i got to pick up eggs, you know. <laughs> so if I... Yep. So, it, does yeah. that caller ID show up no matter what country I'm in? Absolutely. In fact, core to the way Link operates, it's seamless for the user and it's seamless for our MNO partner. There's no changes to our MNO partner network. It's just like you were, if you were in Europe and you roamed your AT&T phone roamed onto, you know, an EE British network and your call came back here to the States and she received the call. It would be absolutely no difference in her experience. And you may not want to answer this question, but do you all have any plans to be able to monitor the same kind of service out of countries like China? That's a delicate question. What I would say at, as a focus of this um, hearing is that the day before Apple announced their SOS feature on the i14, Huawei announced they were going to use Beidou for texting. So as we address spectrum sharing and spectrum rules, I would share that Link feels that speed to market is one of the critical ways that the U.S. can maintain leadership. So not slowing down our innovative companies so they get market share, so that they're the ones in the nations of Africa supplying that connectivity and that we beat China to that market space. Okay, last question from Mr. Strout, back to you. Can we identify, uh, attack satellites in space? Those who are capable of shooting down other satellites. I'm not aware of that technology, but uh, um, I mean, leave, leave it at that. I'm not aware of that technology, being able to identify a satellite that would be used for that purpose. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and at this time, the gentlelady from California's 18th district is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the number of my district has changed due to redistricting, so it's now uh, Sweet 16. We'll, uh, How's that? Go to yeah. that, my friend. Yeah. Uh, congratulations to you on becoming the chairman of this all-important subcommittee. And uh, from our side of the aisle, uh, we're very, very proud of uh, uh, Ms. Matsui. Uh, she has been a leader on this uh, subcommittee for years. Uh, many of her bills have been signed into law uh, by more than one president relating to uh, uh, issues coming out of this subcommittee. So uh, bravo to you, Doris, and uh, thank you to everyone that testified today. 
Um, as I uh, uh, just spoke to uh, what we are really very proud of, uh, especially on this side of the aisle, uh, is the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, it is the, uh, uh, the biggest commitment uh, uh, in terms of policy and dollars uh, since the Eisenhower administration. So if we're gonna play catch up in this country uh, on, uh, on these issues, uh, we have, um, uh, you know, the tank has been filled. Uh, now we have to make sure that those dollars uh, are, um, uh, are used um, uh, very, very well. Uh, $65 billion investment in, uh, in, uh, in broadband. And as the, um, uh, there have been references uh, to that, certainly in the exchange that uh, 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 Congressman uh, Soto had uh, with some of the witnesses, uh, I, I think that this subcommittee really needs to look to uh, NTIA and what they are doing, because while satellite uh, was not um, left out of this, uh, there has to be, um, let's put it this way, I would like to see you uh, have a share in those funds. Uh, and anything that, uh, that, that uh, you know, however we can assist in that, uh, I think is a very important role for this subcommittee, but it certainly is a responsibility of those of you in the satellite industry uh, to uh, uh, help move the needle on that. I'm pleased that the, uh, uh, that the uh, uh, commission has ex uh, established a space bureau, um, uh, but that has to have wings to it, you know. <laughs> uh, to um, uh, Ms. Um, uh, Bingen, uh, in, in your written testimony, you mentioned the convergence of technologies as one of your five uh, noteworthy um, uh, trends, specifically the use of AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, we have a bipartisan uh, uh, AI caucus in the House, and uh, I'm proud to be one of the co-chairs of that uh, effort. So I'm interested in learning more about how uh, AI is being deployed across the country. Uh, can you expand further on it relative to um, uh, the satellite industry? And uh, may maybe specifically, how is AI uh, helping uh, to produce faster, more effective use of uh, space data? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, AI, it is incredible what's happening. And, and when I was in the Department of Defense, I had the good fortune of, of having a, 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 an AI pathfinder under me called uh, Project Maven. We were trying to bring in these innovative commercial companies to look at um, full motion video applying AI techniques. Um, you know, there is so much satellite, I'll, I'll start with satellite imagery. There are so much satellite imagery data out there. Um, part of the challenge up, up till recently is you have analysts that are sitting at screens manually marking objects um, from a military perspective. That's a tank, that's, a, that's an aircraft, that, that's a car. Um, on the civilian front, um, if you were trying to map humanitarian corridors, you would be doing that manually. The beauty of AI is we now have the technology in reach that's been matured and has been deployed to be able to I do that I think I need automated. to uh, interrupt you and follow up with uh, some more specific okay. questions for written uh, responses and, and look forward to uh, uh, you working with the uh, uh, Congressional AI Caucus. Uh, to uh, 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 Ms. Zoller, um, in your exchange with uh, uh, Congressman uh, Soto, what specific regulations uh, uh, do you think that you need? Tying it to that uh, conversation you had with him. Thank you for that question. We're looking for adoption of rules that provide more spectrum for non-geostationary satellite systems and to clarify the rules for sharing spectrum. I see, okay, thank you. Uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and at this time, the chair will recognize the gentleman from Ohio's 12th district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you all for being here. And this first question is for the whole panel. 
Congress needs to continue to promote innovative ways to get Americans connected. I often experience myself and hear from my constituents in Ohio, especially throughout Appalachia, about a lack of reliable connectivity. This hearing is a great opportunity to learn more about the progress that satellite technologies have made toward closing the digital divide. Without reliable connectivity, rural Americans face significant disadvantages that impacts their daily lives, including work, education, and quality healthcare services. The BEAD program has the opportunity to provide reliable, fast, and affordable internet to my constituents. However, I am worried many of my rural constituents that cannot be reached through fiber could still be left behind. Satellites can play a role in closing the digital divide and have the potential to increase competition in the industry, but it still seems like there are barriers to adoption, adoption in rural communities, one of the primary barriers being cost. Can you all discuss what innovations are happening in the industry that could bring the cost of satellite broadband service down for consumers? And Ms. Bingham, we'll start with you and we'll just go down. Thank you. So one area we haven't talked about as much is, is, is the terminal end. We are going from large satellite dishes to, if you were to go to Ukraine today, you'd have dishes that folks are lug lugging around that are literally no bigger than the size of this paper. Uh, Ms. Deckard here talked about you only need your phone, so you don't need to rely on cable, you don't need to rely on um, um, lar large towers uh, to access those rural areas. But to your point, you've got to get the production numbers up to be able to drive down those costs. So, so that would be one example. With respect to satellite direct-to-phone, as we're seeing the market unfold, we're seeing that mobile network operators in this country, in order to keep customers, like T-Mobile, for example, are going to offer it at no additional cost. Because for Link, you know, we have to be able to supply connectivity for someone in the Central African Republic who makes 60 bucks a month. That's why we build cheap, small satellites, because you can't provide that cost-effective connectivity with large, expensive constellations. So I think you'll see with satellite direct to phone that that is affordable for the consumer here in the United States. And I think you'll see the MNOs who want to provide that connectivity and want to keep the subscriber and not lose them to churn, supply that connectivity at a cost-effective price to their consumer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, HughesNet today, um, a subsidiary of our company, provides 25-3 broadband service across the country. We're launching later this year a satellite that will provide 120 speeds um, to consumers throughout the United States, so that's very exciting. In terms of costs, um, as Ms. Bingham noticed, the cost of devices have gone down. We are actually a U.S. manufacturer today of satellite um, ground equipment, and you're seeing cheaper and cheaper devices, home units um, coming on the market. And then I do want to praise the Affordable Connectivity Act. Um, I thought that was uh, a wonderful piece of legislation, and we've seen in terms of an uptake in use on broadband on our system, and I know other companies in other areas, whether fiber or, or wireless, have seen an uptake because of that subsidy for those users who are, in, are, are more poor, um, unable to afford uh, traditional broadband, or making important choices on how to spend their money. So I do rec I would urge Congress and this subcommittee to consider renewing affordable care as that gets, when that lapses. So thank, thank you. you. Ms. Oprah. Invention is part of our DNA, and the place where we see that first and foremost is in our customer terminal. A small, lightweight, affordable customer terminal with an antenna about the size of a small pizza box. So we're focusing on affordability to the consumer. I would just add that in addition to the terminal technology and the ever-increasing capacity and speeds of the satellites, um, broadband service today, satellite broadband service today starts at $49.99, um, and there are multiple plans for less than $100, so um, I would say that it's pretty cost competitive already. Okay, thank you all. Um, I want to try to get this last question in from Ms. Deckard, and I want you to know that we're down to 25 seconds. Um, it was great to hear your perspective uh, on the work being done by your company to help provide cell service. My question for you is what regulatory barriers, uh, be it the licensing process or anything else, have you run into that could prevent other startups from breaking into the industry? Thank you for that question. So for startups that use uh, streamlined processes like the small sat authorization, which were inherently designed to be low risk 
In the small set authorization, there's, you're only allowed 10 satellites. They have to be small, and they have a limited lifetime of six years. We urge the FCC, when it's low risk, go faster. That's the only way America is going to keep its competitive edge. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you much. The gentleman yields back, and it's time the chair recognizes the gentleman from California's 29th district for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lara. It's always been a joy working with you. Congratulations on your chairmanship, and also Ranking Member Eshoo. Uh, I'm sorry, Matsui. I was thinking I was in Health Committee. Uh, Ranking Member Matsui, uh, looking forward to uh, all the wonderful work that we're going to do in this committee together. Um, satellites affect Americans' lives every single day. And I think most of us Americans, if not all of us, take that for granted every, every single day, whether it comes from communication or transportation or even helping out to save lives in emergencies. Um, but what we got to stop taking for granted is that satellites just don't make it up there by themselves. There's a process. And I heard earlier today what I'm gathering from what many of you mentioned is we do have a rigorous process in the United States. It just needs to be faster. Um, but there are other processes around the world where it's a little bit less um, uh, rigorous, yet at the same time, it attracts perhaps maybe folks who maybe shouldn't be putting up satellites so easily. Um, so I, I just want to say that I'm proud of the fact that I live in a country where we do have rigorous regulations, but it's about right-sizing it. It's about making sure that we don't overburden industries and individuals to the point where they throw up their hands and say, forget it, I'm going to go elsewhere. So uh, this committee has an opportunity to help in that process. Uh, we are not regulators, we are lawmakers here. Uh, yet at the same time together, that's what makes our system what it is. The laws that we create and the regulators that are supposed to implement those laws. So hopefully today, uh, not only are the people of America listening how important this issue is, but also we're sending the message to the regulators that we want them, we need them to do a better job and to be more efficient and effective at what they do to make sure that all of you are able to continue to do the wonderful work that you do every single day. So thank you for your testimony. We, I do appreciate your expertise. My first question is to Ms. Deckard. You had an impressive career serving the public as a first responder before co-founding Link. In California, we were constantly dealing with increasing um, uh, severities of wildfires and storms. In your testimony, you note um, Link's mission to revolutionize emergency disaster and response. From an emergency response perspective, can you talk about how uh, having redundancy of networks benefits the public, especially when mobile networks are unavailable. As an engineer myself, redundancy is something that people think is a bad thing, but when it comes to saving lives and systems, redundancy is critical. Absolutely, sir, thank you for the question. So in California, as you well know, in order to combat the wildfire situation and reduce the risk, they employed rolling blackouts, which took down their cell towers. So you can't even alert your public of the proper um, evacuation route Technologies like Link can actually draw a polygon around a certain set of users driving north on a highway and tell them, your, your, your evacuation route is cut, we need you to go south now. And in that way, we can avoid bottlenecks when people need to evacuate. And it's also the coordination for the wildland firefighter. It's not only their safety when they're in the field. You know, on average, we lose 15 wild, wildland firefighters per year. You know, I'm hoping that this year's fire season will not be that bad, but as all the California representatives know, you've seen giga fires in, in the last few years. So being able to support that local firefighter who's most often a volunteer while they do their job, while they're out on the front line and their family needs proper evacuation orders, being able to, to provide that for those communities is absolutely critical to emergency response especially when we are no longer in a season. We're, we're almost fighting fires year round. Yes, well, well, thank you for, um, I just want to compliment you on your journey. Here you are in a very technical field, but yet you provide the practicality and the reality of how this is actually so important to us in everyday life. 
so congratulations on being one of the co-founders of Link. Uh, in your testimony, I've read it. Um, you're very proud of the fact that um, you uh, can actually connect to standard phone systems anywhere in the world where they choose to connect with you. Um, how would that be beneficial to the American who is not high income, the American who works every day for a living and really doesn't have enough money to buy a $1,000 phone or a $1,200 phone? How is that going to help them by having you be more successful in linking them? Absolutely, and that's why Link supports 2G, 4G, and 5G. You know, 46% of the mobile phone users in our world still connect using 2G. We connect $5 feature phones on the Link system all the way up to the high-end smartphone, and that's absolutely critical because you aren't actually solving the digital divide if the person can't afford the terminal without a subsidy. The gentleman has expired and yields back. And the, our next uh, questioner will be the gentleman from Idaho for five minutes. And if I could just mention real quick, I, you've probably all seen that the 11 o'clock votes are now between 12 and 12.30. So if we keep our time within five minutes, we might be able to make it before we all have to go to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question for Ms. Bingen. Ms. Bingen, you uh, talked about permitting as being a, one of the challenges, specifically ITAR. And I want to just ask you to, to go a little bit deeper on that. What is specifically the struggle there? Is it, is it the time that it takes? Is it unreasonable uh, demands? Uh, talk to me about this, the struggles you have with permitting. Um, no, no ab absolutely. I, I, would, I would touch on it in a couple of different areas and start by saying, um, we want our industrial base to be healthy, to be successful. Um, it is very attractive to many of our allies and partners that want to work with us on our space capabilities. Um, and those allies and partners, they have a choice between American business and, and, and other foreign, foreign companies, including China. I think the challenge with the ITAR process, and I say, it, it was, des I'd, like us to, I'd like to see us go back and look at you know, what were the original assumptions and the context driving the way the policy exists today? Because I would argue that the technology has evolved so much that certain satellite technologies are still controlled under ITAR, despite it being out in the commercial you know, marketplace for others to be able to leverage. Uh, the time, the process is still very timely. It's opaque to commercial companies. Um, and then back to the foreign competition. I, I don't think it fully accounts for the explosion of foreign competition that our U.S. businesses are up against. Okay, thank you. That, that segues into another concern that you brought up that, frankly, I didn't fully understand. Counterspace weapons. Talk to me about what you meant by that phrase and what the concern is. Ab absolutely, and our adversaries know how reliant we are on space. So their objective is how do I figure out how to interfere with that or deny American or, or, or other, other partners that have space capabilities? How do I deny their use? And that can be a range of a, a spectrum of different options. So everything from um, I can employ something to jam your communication satellite, I can employ a cyber attack against your ground station, which we saw happen in Ukraine to a commercial uh, satellite operator to uh, dazzling, using a laser, an optical system, to uh, at the higher end, uh, or more kinetic end, um, launching a missile, a direct ascent anti-satellite so missile get, that would hit a satellite. That. So in your opinion, what is the appropriate action there? Is it to enable the private sector to address those? Is it to, to uh, fund uh, US resources to try to take that challenge on? What's the, what's the answer? I, th I think it's both, is um, the government has a role to play because they understand the threats and, and they have invested in certain kind of pr protect no uh, protection technologies and, and concepts. But on the commercial side, the best thing the government can do for them is to share information. Got it, okay, thank you. I wanna shift to Mr. Straub for just a second. Mr. Straub, in your list of industry needs, you had five of them, the second or the third one was funding for oversight. Specifically, oversight for what? So for example, the FCC. Uh, responsible for licensing um, and ensuring that interference issues are addressed. So that, I, that's what I'm referring to in terms of oversight. FCC, uh, okay, got it. 
Uh, in, in, in addition, um, the, the, the uh, space sustainability issue that I mentioned, the Department of Space Commerce at the, at the Department of Commerce is responsible for putting in place a space situational awareness system. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, uh, we've been talking about uh, bridging the digital divide. Uh, to your earlier comments, what needs to happen there is cost coverage and performance. Yeah, in I, your view, are we there with cost coverage and performance to bridge that? And, and I, I'll me back that up by saying I live in a state that has under 2 million people, one of the largest states in the country, um, a lot of rural space. Is the cost coverage and performance there today? So I think that the issue that we encounter, and I also am from a rural area that make, where it makes no sense to uh, deploy a terrestrial-based system, a fiber system. Um, and so we're deploying a number of different satellite systems, but as I'd mentioned before, the system that has been placed potentially is not going to allow satellite systems to participate in the funding. Um, so certainly the NTIA rules did not prohibit satellite companies from participating. We're looking at how it's being implemented, but ultimately our fear is that money is going to go to overbuilding areas that already have service instead of areas like the ones that you're referencing um, that, could, that could benefit from being able to, provide, to obtain some of the funding to provide broadband service there. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and at this time, the gentlelady from Michigan's 6th District is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for having this hearing. Thank you to the ranking member, Masui, as well, and to all of the witnesses, because this is a really important subject. Innovative satellite technologies have proven crucial in expanding broadband access, emergency and disaster response, and 5G adoption. And as the committee, we've got to consider forward-looking policies that will promote these groundbreaking technologies, clarify the responsibility of industry, regulators, and quite frankly, government at all levels, and ultimately benefit Americans and their communities. This topic is important, and I look forward to working with all my colleagues on this committee to make it a reality. I've often said that innovation is a core strength of the United States. We got to keep it that way, and we can't take it for granted. It takes a lot of work to keep the United States at the forefront of cutting edge technologies. I see that firsthand in the automotive industry where I've been working ty tirelessly to ensure that we continue to empower our greatest minds and our strong workforces to keep us ahead uh, of our global competitors. In the satellite industry, the US has gotten a head start, but we need to keep moving forward and as you all know, but I think too many don't realize, our global competitors are nipping at our heels. I know that the U.S. is currently responsible for more than 60% of the satellites in the orbit, but in the last few years, the combined satellite fleets of China and Russia have grown by approximately 70%. Mr. Straup and or Ms. Bingham, given this data, what is your assessment of U.S. leadership in this market? Is counting the number of satellites sufficient, or are there other metrics we need to be considering? Mr. Strapp, why don't you go first? Sorry, could you repeat the question? So, given the data, is your assessment of U.S. what is your assessment of U.S. leadership in this market, and is counting the number of satellites sufficient, or do we need other metrics now? We definitely need other metrics. Um, so. Counting satellites is one example, but the amount of capacity that uh, each of those is capable of providing is also an imp important metric. And so we've seen a tremendous increase in the capacity. And so I think that whether we're looking at competition or whether it's just the capabilities of the industry, taking it beyond the numbers of satellites. So uh, each of the satellites that are being launched to have much more capacity, higher speeds, remote sensing satellites have greater uh, uh, imaging capability. So I think we need to look at the specific satellite, that capability, what's been, what it's being produced for. Thank you, Ms. Bingham. Would you have anything to add quickly? Three are market share, things like where the investment dollars are coming from, the customer base, including international and commercial customers, looking at technology and performance, speed in particular, uh, and then also standards and best practices. Are others looking to U.S. or are they looking to China? Thank you. I'm going to ask you to expand on that and follow up questions. I also chair the Congressional 5G Caucus and understand the importance of next generation wireless connectivity to unlock growth and digital innovation in this country. In the last Congress, I joined my colleagues, Rep. Wahlberg, Johnson, and Custard to introduce the Promoting United States 
Wireless Leadership Act, which focused on leveraging the U.S. role and setting international standards to maintain leadership in an increasingly competitive market. Ms. Manor, in your testimony, you mentioned the role that EchoStar played in the third generation partnership project and what that meant for the satellite industry. Can you talk in more detail about how participation in these standard setting bodies by U.S. companies and stakeholders helps advance U.S. economic, competitiveness, and national security interests? Thank you. Um, yes. Um, we're not just talking about 3GPP, we're talking about other bodies, including the International Telecommunications Union and the U.S. most recently, um, U.S. companies, um, our company and some of the other sat our satellite operator colleagues are advancing further inclusion into 5G and 6G standards there. I really do believe if the U.S. companies weren't there, um, we wouldn't be represented. My concern, however, is that the U.S. government, especially at the ITU, which is a treaty organization is always supportive of the satellite industry. And, and even in our efforts to have satellite inclusion, we've sometimes had some delay or slowdown because of US government intervention. So it, it's one of those areas that I'm ashamed to say I don't participate on the US delegation. I participate as a sector member because we are unable to get the US government support. And that, that's something we'd like to see overcome as satellite becomes increasingly important for strategic needs and for economic needs that the U.S. government is more supportive of us. I probably need to follow up on that in Q&A, and I'm going to be out of time, and nobody should be surprised but I, that I've got autonomous vehicle questions, which I know my partner behind me that we're working on uh, probably does too. So I want to thank you all for being here today, and uh, we all need to work together to keep our competitiveness. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, and at this time, the chair recognizes the gentleman from California's 23rd district for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. I'd like to continue a line of questioning that Congressman Cardenas started about the way that satellite technology can help fight wildfires in California. Uh, it really can't be overstated how dire a situation this is. We had a relatively light wildfire season last year. The year before that was our second worst in the history of the state, uh, overshadowed only by the year before that, which was the worst wildfire season we've ever had. And uh, Ms. Deckard, I wish I shared your optimism that this season would be light. Unfortunately, when we have a wet winter as we've had, that fuels the growth of the latter fuels and uh, those dry out in the summer and then that just makes it all the worse in the winter. So uh, it, we, we face a real desperate situation in California. Uh, we have some promising new tools to be able to deal with this situation, we have large aerial assets that if they're dispatched in a timely manner, they can quickly go to the source of ignition on a fire, for, for, for example, a, a lightning strike that ignites a tree, and put that out completely uh, without uh, having to rely on ground-based assets as long as they get there in on time. If the flame front is allowed to spread, it becomes too large for aerial assets to put out and, and therefore uh, a, a much larger problem and, and the potential for spread. So, uh, Mr. Strop, uh, the one thing that we desperately need is satellite-based thermal imagery that's real-time and high-resolution enough to detect something as small as a tree that's ignited by a lightning strike. And as Ms. Bingen had pointed out uh, earlier in the testimony, we can then pair that with AI tools that can distinguish between a campfire and a lightning strike and uh, you know get those assets on the way and, and solve that problem before it becomes a bigger problem. Uh, unfortunately, up until now, the geostationary platforms that we had access to are high enough that we can't get enough resolution to be able to accomplish that. But with the advent of all of these low Earth orbit satellites now, we are much closer to the ground. We can deploy those, those sensing technologies uh, as long as we can get that information back, we can start to put these tools into motion. But we, we don't have a platform for that right now. Uh, so, Mr. Strop, what can be done to catalyze the, uh, the, the availability of uh, this solution to what's a really critical problem for us? Thank you for the question. <clears throat> question. And you, you are right. There are non-geostationary satellite systems that have the capability of refreshing the data much more quickly uh, multiple times a day in, in, uh, uh, in some examples with optical imagery. Um, there are the synthetic uh, aperture radars that have the ability to see through clouds, through smoke. 
Um, the question that you pointed, uh, that you, or the, the case example that you cited in terms of being able to detect a lightning strike at a tree, I'm not sure whether that capability exists, and I look forward to, to checking with our members and getting back to you about that capability. But I think the combination of those technologies uh, will address part of what you're describing. Also, the ability to be able to identify access roads in that, are, uh, that remain uh, accessible. Uh, and then, of course, being able to provide the communications to those people, those firefighters who are on the ground. Thank you. Well, let me point out to the systems operators that are here, uh, you know, Kuiper and Echo Star and Link, uh, SpaceX, if they're listening. Uh, this is, I know that the primary focus for low Earth orbit is communications, uh, but imaging should also be a focus for us. And this is technology that I'm convinced could be deployed relatively inexpensively, and yet, the value of that data in doing things, and this is just one narrow domain, the prevention of, of, of wildfires by dispatching aerial assets. There are lots of other applications for other sensing technologies that has huge commercial value. Uh, I'm sure that ways could be found to pay for it. Uh, and uh, with the time I have remaining, uh, Ms. Bingen, I, I was very interested in the testimony from you and several of the other panelists on the way that export restrictions uh, have hampered the ability of U.S. satellite equipment companies to compete internationally. Can you talk a little bit more on the changes to export law that you think need to be made, uh, and, and particularly highlight those that could be made and, and why you feel that they would not affect our national security? Uh, and, and it's a really, I think the tough part here is to, to find a better balance. And I recall being in the executive branch um, in interagency discussions, we would always put national security against economic interest, and it was always national security card one. I think the thing that we need to think about now is how do we broaden our thinking on national security? It's not just military and intelligence, but it's also our economic um, security, which I think is a big part of that. Um, we have to still be able to protect our technology from getting to China, I mean, hands down, absolutely. But there are so many allies and partners out there that could benefit from um, whether it be certain new forms of remote sensing technology, some of the ones that you highlighted, um, certain satellite technology components, software, some of our commercial launch service providers um, that are still kind of stuck in that traditional ITAR process that is very opaque to them and very lengthy. So um, some of the same recommendations we're making on the regulatory front, I'd say let's take a look at those for, for the ITAR process. Okay, well, this is a conversation I'm very interested in continuing, but Thank uh, you, I see I'm out of time. Thank you for the testimony. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired, and the chair recognizes the general lady from New Hampshire for five minutes. Thank you to our subcommittee leader, Chair Lada, and ranking member Matsui for holding this important hearing today. We appreciate it. I'm a new member on this subcommittee, and I'm excited that our first hearing is on a subject that's vital of vital importance to rural communities like my state, New Hampshire, satellites. Satellite technology provides critical basic internet services for many rural communities. However, as we've come to learn, basic internet services are no longer enough to meet the demands of today's world. During the COVID-19 pandemic, nearly every aspect of our lives moved to virtual platforms. Many companies and small businesses shifted to a virtual workplace, our children went to school online, and we attended our doctor's appointments via telehealth services. In Congress, I'm committed to doing everything I can to improve internet connectivity in rural communities. That's why I'm proud to have supported the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, investing $65 billion in broadband infrastructure to connect communities nationwide. And I also serve on uh, Mr. Clyburn's Rural Broadband Task Force as well. This investment is going to help us ensure access to high-speed, reliable, affordable broadband internet services for homes, business, schools, and hospitals. So today at this hearing, I'm excited to learn more about how we can use satellite technology to help connect more Americans to the internet. For many in my district, the barrier to broadband internet services is not accessibility, but affordability. So Mr. Straub, if I could, Currently, in some communities, the cost of satellite broadband service and consumer equipment may be higher than the alternatives. Can you speak to how the satellite industry and recent technological advances can help to lower costs and provide affordable, reliable broadband? So one of the things that's happening in some communities is installing 
community Wi-Fi systems um, in order to share the cost of uh, the service and the equipment. Of course, the industry is continuously trying to, to find ways to lower the cost and ease the installation of the equipment. Um, but I think that this is an ideal example of how the subsidies can be applied. Uh, and I would encourage uh, every member here to convey that to, the, uh, uh, to their states as they're going through establishing the process for determining who is going to qualify for broadband funding. Um, because buying down the cost of the equipment is certainly a legitimate uh, means of bringing down the cost of, of, of service, uh, as you noted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the Granite State, we take great pride in the preservation of our beautiful forests and remote regions, which are the bedrock of our tourism economy. Now, recently, many of our major wireless companies have announced partnerships with satellite providers to extend service to some of the hardest to reach places including parks, forests, and even ski areas around the country. Uh, Ms. Decker, could you elaborate on these capabilities and their implications on the future of wireless and satellite connectivity across the country? Thank you for the question. So I think the implications are, the reason why we haven't seen a total build out of terrestrial towers in the United States is because of the CapEx and OpEx. That's why our mobile network operator partners are looking to a satellite solution. In addition to the fact, as you mentioned, our beautiful national parks, people do not want to go out into the national park and see a cell tower, but what they do want is connectivity, so if the park closes, which we've had happen, uh, they want instructions for how to leave it, and when they suffer an emergency, they want to be able to call for help. So I think as you've seen, the mobile network operators are looking to partner with satellite companies to fill in the gaps in their coverage. And we've had examples, you gave the example of the family out in California, we've had uh, accidents and deaths on Mount Washington as well, and we're only, you know, it's literally two hours from Boston, but it's very remote in the White Mountains and very rugged to get the rescue crews in there, and frequently they will find you know, the cell phone, either the battery's dead or they're frantically trying to reach uh, somebody by, and there's, there's just not service. So um, thank you for everything that you're doing for safety and security for people, and thank you to all of you. This has been a fascinating hearing for me, and um, with 30 seconds left, I will well, yield back. Sure a model that. new the, member the of the general committee. lady yields back. <laughs> thank thank you. you very much. At this time, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia's 12th district for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm very pleased to uh, be on the Energy and Commerce Committee and uh, on this subcommittee on communications and technology uh, for the 118th Congress. Uh, this uh, subcommittee has uh, jurisdiction over many issues uh, that you've heard about that we all face in our districts primarily uh, rural broadband, uh, consistent cell service, and others. Uh, you know, resolving uh, these issues seems to be a little complicated. Uh, just to give you an example, though, of some of the great things that I'm enjoying from satellite is satellite radio. Uh, you know, I spend about 36 weeks here in Congress, and then the rest of the time I spend in my district, which covers 23 counties, and in a week, we'll put as many as 2,000 miles on the car. And without satellite radio, I don't know that I would find out exactly what's going on out there. Uh, but, the, but the other uh, issues are the, the cell phone coverage. And then, of course, broadband and, uh, and all these other things. And I will tell you something on the agriculture side. Um, I grew up on a tractor on a small farm. The last time I was on a tractor, I did not touch the wheel. And I planted peanuts 16 inches over from where they were planted the year before in a row that was perfect. It was, it was an experience like uh, no other. So we're making tremendous advances, tremendous advances. And there are great stories out there. But how do we get to where we need to be? Um, for example, the most frustrating thing in my district is trying to use my phone. I mean, we drive by a cell tower, and I can't get cell service. I don't understand that. And, uh, you know, obviously, is, if it's the FCC, I don't know. Uh, uh, Ms. Deckard, I mean, what, what can we do to advance, uh, you know, the technology as, as far as broadband and cell phone quickly 
uh, because you know we're running a lot of fiber optics in my district right now. Uh, it, it, because I guess we, your satellite's just not there. But are we going to be in a position very quickly where satellite will be there? Or, I mean, it, are these competing technologies, or how can we? You know, how's this going to work? Well, I think that uh, thank you for the question, sir. I they're not competing technologies. There's a role for every one of these ways we supply connectivity. It's really having a portfolio of options. There's places where laying fiber is the best option, and there's places where using satellite is the best option. And the great thing about satellite is it provides network resiliency for the fiber-based networks when they go down for whatever reason. So it's not an either or. It's how we build those services and continue to support the American public and meet their communications needs, which are growing on an everyday basis yeah. as we move forward. Well, and obviously GPS is critical because we use that in the construction industry. Uh, again, our motor graders and all are self-guided and that sort of thing. As far as the uh, security, um, you know, we talked about security and Mr. Uh, Strupp, uh, what, uh, What's your biggest challenge is, is de in dealing with, uh, you know, adversaries, that sort of thing? I mean, I, we talked about the competition with China. You know, frankly, I think we, we've got to figure out how to get ahead, ahead there. But uh, from a security standpoint, obviously, what we're running into with, uh, with broadband and, and uh, the Internet and uh, email and all these other things, uh, is, would, would satellite help that situation? So thank you for the question. And if I may add to the, uh, the prior question, I think one of the ways of helping to drive adoption of the satellite connected con connections to mobile phones is to convey to mobile carriers that given the technology is being deployed, there's an expectation that they will uh, utilize it to be able to provide coverage into those areas. So the security of satellite systems is extremely important. And we uh, created a set of uh, cybersecurity principles probably at least five years ago. We are in the process of updating them. Uh, most of the companies in the industry provide service or seek to provide service to the U.S. military. And as you can well imagine, they have requirements to be able to provide service uh, in conjunction with the military. So uh, this is an ongoing process. Um, uh, we received warnings, SIA received warnings at the initiation of the war in, in Ukraine to notify our members that they may be subject to cybersecurity attacks. Uh, it wasn't necessarily anything we needed to convey because it's an issue that is top of mind of, of all of the carriers. Okay. All right. Service, well, I'm, so. I'm sorry I'm out of time, but, but one thing I, I'm going to submit a question on the capital markets. As, as far as the capital markets and, and their investment, obviously they've been uh, cell phone in the past or cell towers in the past. How do we, what are the capital markets doing to help you? get this new uh, technology up. Well, if I, if I thank if you, interrupt, I'll yield back. But uh, if the gentleman would like to submit that question yeah. in writing, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, the gentlelady from Illinois Second District is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you know, the digital divide is real, and we must act to ensure all Americans have equitable access to broadband services. As you've already heard a lot on this committee, we're concerned about our rural areas, and in Illinois, more than half of rural households don't have access to broadband internet, and nationally, 24 million people lack access to broadband services, or about one in 13 Americans, but in rural communities, one in three lack access, and those lacking access are more likely to be poor, more likely to have children, more likely to be people of color. So broadband services are necessary for Americans to do their jobs, and increasingly important for our youth. If we want the U.S. to remain a top global competitor, we must invest in high-speed broadband services to ensure economic progress and educational attainment. And far too many of our communities have been left out of the digital revolution. So I look forward to hearing about how we can modernize our laws so that our nation's schools, hospitals, small businesses, and rural farms all have access to reliable broadband infrastructure. Mr. Stroop, in your written testimony, you mentioned that the satellite industry is prepared to bring the furthest corners of America into the 21st century by serving as the most viable technology capable of bridging, bridging the digital divide in rural areas, as well as working to bring the nation into an interconnected future. 
Can you speak to any specifics about how your industry can assist terrestrial networks in helping close the digital divide in rural America where so many of our communities are unserved or underserved? Yes, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, of course, we've been talking about broadband extensively, so the ability to provide service directly to consumers, schools, hospitals via, via satellite uh, broadband is one example. But in addition, um, as we've also discussed, the inclusion of satellite in uh, 5G standards. Um, so there are two aspects to it. One is the backhaul capability, so where it does not make sense to be able to uh, provide backhaul via microwave, fiber optics, whatever the industry has the ability to provide that for mobile carriers. And of course, we've also been talking about the direct to mobile connectivity, which is another part of the, the 3GPP standard. So um, I think that the combination of those is uh, the means by which we're able to provide the backhaul infrastructure. Okay. I have over 1,500, um, probably closer to 2,000 farms in my district, which is the backbone of the economy uh, in Illinois. Can you speak to the agricultural applications of satellites and how ensuring U.S. satellite leadership can have a positive impact on the farms in my district? Is Absolutely. And, and um, um, you know, one of the best examples was then that, that which was cited um, um, being able to provide or utilize GPS for um, um, the control of uh, tractors or other farm equipment, um, being able to utilize sensors um, to be able to determine whether it's uh, the additional um, uh, water, fertilizer, whatever is needed. Um, they'd be able to remain in, in uh, con constant communication, uh, whether it's through uh, uh, mobile connectivity, broadband connectivity, all of these are important. So. Um, while we may get to the point where we no longer need to even be in the farm equipment, um, uh, farmers are, are, are um, business people. They need to be able to continue to uh, monitor crop situations. So I think it's a, a combination of all of those. Thank you. NASA and government generally used to, be, used to be the only game in town when it came to satellite operation. But obviously, this is no longer the case. Ms. Zoller, how, can, how should we be thinking about the role of commercial satellites as more providers into the market, and does the prospect of commercial heavy future in this area change that we should be thinking about the policy and regulatory environment? Thank you for that question. We should be thinking about the policy and regulatory environment in terms of enabling innovation and competition, taking a careful and light touch to policy and regulations so that we can continue to advance our technology over time without requiring new rules. Thank you. Ms. Bingen, do you have anything to quickly add? I'd just like to add is to your point on this used to be in the domain of governments. What's great about commercial now is it's based on unclassified off-the-shelf technology. Um, the data that's being collected is unclassified share and shareable. So we are now opening up this data to so many more applications than we would have traditionally done in the past. So you mentioned agriculture, um, uh, environmental monitoring, humanitarian disaster relief operations, even sanctions enforcement or, or insurance that had we used those government systems, they would have never gotten priority to be able to do that. Thank you, and I yield back with a second. <laughs> General Lady yields back, and at this time, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas 11th District for five minutes. Uh, I think the chair, and what, what a great discussion. So many good points that have been made. Um, I, I come from a rural area like so many on this committee. Um, and I think our competition, especially when we look at, you know, just connecting people, whether it's in the agriculture business or in the in energy industry, uh, like I represent, um, certainly the national security focus is really important. I want to get to that. I represent uh, AST, an important uh, competitor in this marketplace. And let me get to the national security focus. I spent 20 years uh, in the Air Force um, depending, as was said, um, on space. My question and my concern actually is the speed of relevancy and the denial of that relevancy when it comes to competition and innovation and getting the permits approved. Um, and so, Ms. Bing, I'll start with you. Um, you know, when it comes to the FCC, are they operating at the speed of relevancy? I don't want to leave this committee hearing with any, you know, nebulous ideas on that. And if not, what is the cost when it comes to dual-use technology, when it comes to t technology in space that can be used not just for commercial interests but also to enhance our national security? It's a great question, sir. I, I, I am encouraged by the steps that they are taking. 
but there's still, I think, a long way to go, and it'll have to be a continuous process as the technology is evolving so quickly. Six months from design to satellite on orbit. If we can get FCC to be able to make a decision in six months, that is huge, right? Um, and so back to the point on the, on the implications or the consequences, if we can't get these approvals in a timely way, in ways that these companies who are moving so fast have some level of predictability and planning, they're not gonna be on the field competing where we know that there are competitors and that China is out there actively seeking the same customer set as our companies are. Um, Mr. Straub, for when it, when it comes to kind of the technical uh, risk from the answer we just heard, I mean, is it spectrum? Is it competition for spectrum? Is it, you know, where are our adversaries able to gain if we don't have that speed of relevancy, if the permitting process or the licensure or the things that are needing to be done don't happen at that, that speed of relevancy? Well, certainly our if our adversaries have access to Spectrum and dealing with some of these issues more quickly, they have the ability to deploy a constellation, then for therefore go out and to compete uh, globally um, if, while we're still trying to go through the permitting process if we allow that to happen. So that's one of the biggest risks mm -hmm. in, in addition to the access to Spectrum. So, um, I would also note, uh, as uh, the chairwoman of the FCC stated, you know, the rules were in place 15 years ago when we built and launched a handful of satellites. We've been talking about the tremendous increase in the number of satellites, the 64,000 applications. Um, we're in a different world today, and there, you know, is, it's not unusual for regulators to try and catch up with technology. That's what we're going through. I'll give each of you 30 seconds um, for the commercial side. Um, Ms. Degger, we'll start with you. In your own companies, what, uh, is there technology that you have now that now you're waiting on licensure, and then by the time you get it approved or by the time you're able to you know, I mean, is it is it past that point and it's moved on? Uh, fortunately, we've had overall a very positive experience with the FCC. I will echo Ms. Zoller's comments. The, the FCC licensed our payload in a record amount of time, and that was the Office of Engineering and Technology with an experimental license. We've also taken a crawl, walk, run approach for the FCC where we've launched five experimental payloads. So they got to know us as a company before we put in our commercial application. I will again reiterate that when the FCC has a tool like the SmallSat authorization, which is meant to be streamlined and sets parameters on it to reduce the risk, we would like the FCC to be able to lean in in the processing timeline. Thank you, Ms. Manner. So, so thank you. I want to bring up um, two other issues. One is the U.S., and I brought this up earlier in response to the chairman's question, was the ITU. Um, we're limited the number of ITU filings we can find, file as U.S. operators, so many of us have to go overseas to get our satellite networks licensed. Um, that's a big hindrance. But I also want to talk about speed for a second, and there is an important part that the FCC does, and it's to protect against harmful interference. So we don't want them to go so fast where we neglect and we do something sloppy and we put something up that hasn't been proven and tested. So there is, there is that, this is still a technological issue. So while well, I'm fully in favor of faster processing, we've had applications pending for over mm -hmm. two years. Um, I, at times it may make sense to balance it and have some. Ms. Zoller, I'm sorry, I'm out of time, but uh, we, we can submit for the record, but it sounds like speed is important, security is important, but do it here in the United States instead of offshore. I yield back. Thank you very much, gentlemen, yields back. The chair recognizes the general lady from Texas, the seventh district for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Latta, and thank you, Ranking Member Matsui, uh, for convening our first uh, and very informative hearing today. Um, I'm glad to be serving again on this subcommittee and look forward to your leadership. Um, as many have noted uh, in testimony and in questions today, um, this growing industry has great potential to connect Americans in rural and underserved areas and to provide life-saving service during emergencies and natural disasters. And um, in, in Texas's seventh congressional district that I represent um, and along the Texas Gulf Coast, we are unfortunately all too familiar with flooding and extreme rain events and hurricanes and emergency uh, and natural disasters. In August of 2017, as many will remember, Hurricane Harvey devastated the region, um, disrupting many emergency call centers and cell sites and causing life-threatening outages for our residents. 
Um, so several have spoken about the benefits of satellite telecommunications for consumers experiencing disasters and communities recovering from disasters. And I really want to focus my questions there. Um, and Ms. Deckard, you spoke passionately and really powerfully, I think, in, in this hearing um, about how satellites can provide continuous service for consumers dealing with disasters and emergencies. You know, they always tell us the best way uh, to communicate is to tell stories. And I think your story was incredibly powerful. And, you know, who can forget which way do you turn um, when you get to the road? I think that that um, illustrates the, the challenge in front of us. And so what I want to ask you first is, are there sort of disaster or post-disaster conditions that satellites are uniquely suited to addressing or uniquely disadvantaged in your experience? I feel that satellites are uniquely an advantage in the disaster, both pre, during, and post-event. You know, the one of the main features of um, Link that we're rolling out initially is emergency cell broadcast. Well, if you don't have connectivity where you live and work, you're not even getting that preparedness announcement mm -hmm. in order to plan for the coming event. During, because of the, the um, RF bands that we use from space, we can transmit during very wet weather. So we again provide that connectivity piece when you're beginning to lose your cellular terrestrial infrastructure. And then immediately during the post event, that instantaneous backup. Right now, our emergency responders rely on cellular towers on wheels to be deployed post-event. And no matter how efficient they get at queuing these things up, even multiple states away to drive them in post-event, that takes time. Mm -hmm. And it's that self-organization, which I have experienced, every first responder living and working in their own community has experienced that self-organization right after an event. That's where you save the most lives. Well, and you really anticipated my next question because I was going to shift to emergency responders. And I think if you could just um, help, certainly it makes sense of why this is an advantage or that it's an advantage. But can you talk a little bit more detail about what it is um, that satellites can do to support our emergency call centers and responders in times of crisis specifically? Oh, absolutely. So long, you know, this year alone, we've had 168 tornadoes in the United States and it's February 2nd. We are seeing a lot of long track tornadoes. Satellite technology, because of their unique capabilities, I can reroute emergency phone calls to a different PSAP. So in Kentucky, when you had that long track tornado and it takes down a PSAP, I can draw a polygon around it, send those calls to another PSAP that's still up and operating, and begin to get immediate and appropriate resources dispatched to where they need to be. Um, thank you. That's an incredibly helpful illustration. And I will note uh, for my colleagues, we experienced some of those tornadoes in Texas and in the Houston area uh, very recently. And, and our community, uh, especially in uh, southeast Houston, is still recovering from these tornadoes, which are not uh, usually occurring as frequently um, in our area. And so I think adjusting to the different kinds of disasters we're seeing across the country is also a challenge for all of us. And so bringing all of these resources together is incredibly important. Um, I only have 30 seconds left, and I know we're trying to get to votes. Um, I have several more questions. So what I would like to do is submit my my questions for the record because I would like to hear from all of you on, on some of these issues and I just want to thank you for your time being here today. This has been an incredibly informative hearing for me and I know for my colleagues. So thank you very much, Chairman Latta. With that, I will yield back. Thank you very much. The general lady yields back. The chair recognizes the general lady from Florida's third district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, congratulate you and thank you for holding this very important hearing today. Also to our witnesses, thank you for hanging in there with us. I know we're coming to the end. I represent a very unique district in North Central Florida, Florida's fighting third district, the Gator Nation. We have a large swath of rural areas where uh, truly the only internet option is dial up. I'm not even joking. And uh, Pair that with our urban clusters, which we are home to, as I said, the University of Florida, the Gator Nation, where we have cutting edge AI technology. We, it's remarkable. So it's two very different worlds that this district encompasses. So the satellite marketplace is a very interesting and attractive area for us. So I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, I will not lie, I'm extraordinarily frustrated with the FCC 
for, for a number of reasons, but I really feel like when it comes to satellite deployment and this technology, it's kind of like the mid-90s with cell phones. They don't know really how to regulate it, how to handle it. They're trying, and, and I give them credit. Ms. Deckard, you said today in answering one of my colleagues that speed to market is how we stay not dominant but competitive as well. Under this new FCC initiative, the Space Innovation Agenda, we're seeing an increase in which they are approving the applications. And that's a good thing. Added 38% uh, more in terms of their division size to move applications. But my question is to you, Ms. Deckard, and to you, Mr. Stroop, is it enough? Is it enough? We throw money at problems all day long in Washington, D.C., but it doesn't really seem to work too often or very well. So what do we need to be doing in terms of the personnel that we need to bring in to process these applications? And is there a labor issue or is it we just, we continue to throw money and wonder why it doesn't get fixed? I'll let you go, Ms. Deckard, and then to you, Mr. Stroop. Thank you. Well, I think we're at a point where we've seen Chairwoman Rosenworcel and the commissioners who have also long been worried about the time it takes them to process applications put forth a new structure with the Space Bureau. Mm -hmm. And I know from Link's perspective, we are excited to see um, that new organization, the new organization of the International Bureau with their focus on the ITU filings. And we're just excited to be part of the conversation moving forward to make sure that whatever they put in place really does work for both small and large companies alike. Thank you. And in addition with you know, this hearing here today, I think it's a winning combination when both the FCC and Congress realizes we have got to change the way we do business in order for American to lead. Thank you. Mr. Stroop. Thank you for the question. I would like to see more resources made available. Many of it is engineering related. Some of the issues are complex. Okay. Um, they have made steps to streamline some of the processes for small constellations as an example. But the fact that we still have the backlog is, indi is indicative of something. Um, certainly the fact that um, they're in competition with industry, with other government agencies for engineering talent, um, shows some of the challenges, but ultimately giving them the resources, and I would argue for more resources for them to be able to deal with the backlog and address some of the, the issues that we've been talking about today. Okay. I, I'm going to follow up with you specifically in, in a written question. Ms. Zoller, you, you were asked a bit of time ago about regulations that you need within this space. You stated that more regulations relating to spectrum were needed. Um, as we all know, regulations, more regulations doesn't necessarily mean better outcomes. So it, in that same vein, what regulations do you not need on the books? The regulations should provide the flexibility to operators to determine how to meet an objective. That's In like other words, if, 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 the, if the point is to apply a power limit to a satellite system to pr protect terrestrial services, let us figure out the combination of antennas and transmitters and so on to meet that. Give so maybe, us the liberty to do that. Okay. So a little bit more flexibility, which flexibility and regulations don't typically go hand in hand, but we'll figure that out. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to submit for the record uh, how the Farm Bill, which will be coming up this year, uh, that element of the Ag Committee and the jurisdiction under the Ag Committee in concert with Energy and Commerce, what we can do to advance some of the satellite technology um, but in the 13 seconds that I have remaining, I do want to say that I am so grateful for your testimony here today. Satellite communication, satellite technology, it's going to save lives. It's not only going to improve them, it is going to save lives. I say that as the wife of a first responder in a very rural area where <clears throat> this type of technology is going to be the next generation for us. So thank you so much, and thank you again to the chairman. Thank you very much, Ge lady, General Lady's time has expired. Just to let you all know they've changed it again. We're probably going to be voting between 12 and 12.05 now. So if we could keep our questioning short, we'll try to get through, because I'd hate to keep the panel here for uh, votes and then have to come back for a couple of members. So the General Lady from uh, New York is recognized. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations to you and our ranking member. Uh, for your ascension to leadership uh, on this very important committee. And let me thank our panelists for bringing your expert witness uh, to the panel today. Let me also take a moment to recognize and congratulate my dear friend, Congresswoman Matsui, on her first hearing 
as ranking member of the subcommittee. Between ranking member Matsui and our new full committee chairwoman, it is so heartening to see the dawn of a new era of female leadership of this very historic committee. Well, last year, Congress passed the transformational bipartisan infrastructure law, which included major investments in broadband connectivity and environmental justice. While these investments represent an important and historic step forward, much work remains to close the digital divide and address the disparate impact of climate change on historically marginalized communities. Advances in technology, such as the burgeoning satellite marketplace, will play a crucial role in addressing our nation's inequities. On the topic of broadband deployment and access, fiber remains the best tool in our toolkit to bring high-speed connectivity to all Americans. But despite our best efforts, gaps will remain, and low Earth orbit satellites represent an intriguing option to fill those, op to fill those gaps. So Ms. Zoller, uh, can you begin by explaining how low Earth satellites uh, differ from other kinds of satellite technology and how LEO constellations bring new opportunities to the satellite industry? Thank you for that question. It starts with the altitude. Low Earth orbit systems are below 2,000 kilometers, or roughly 1,200 miles. Kuiper will be at about 370 miles above the Earth. So it takes a constellation of satellites to provide connectivity. That constellation provides resiliency. You have a lot of satellites in view of any one place on Earth. It also provides for low latency. The round trip to the internet is fast. And the beams that are transmitted from the satellite to the Earth are small, and that means we can reuse spectrum efficiently. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Strauss, uh, more broadly, can you explain on the potential role of satellites in helping bridge the digital divide in areas where other networks may not be able to reach uh, and how we can move quickly towards a more connected future? And would any of the other panelists also comment on that? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. And you know, the fact that satellites provide a broad signal across the entire country, I think is one of the keys, the key advantage. You mentioned fiber optics and where there are fiber optics, uh, it makes uh, sense to utilize them. But there are many areas of the country that will never be reached by fiber optic uh, technology and satellites currently provide coverage uh, across the country. So we're in a position to be able to take advantage of it. Some, we've also talked about some of the affordability issues and ensuring that we have access to the funding that is, made that is intended to be made available uh, to ensure that everybody has access to broadband, I think, is one of the key aspects of it. Thank you. Um, I would also point, I'm building on what Mr. Schaub said, is timely deployment. So even if you're using funding for broadband for fiber, it's going to take years for that fiber to be deployed. So satellite can also serve as an interim solution right. while that, that's being set up so that at least people have broadband now and then can, can use something different in the future. Very well. Did either of you want to comment on that? It's, you know, it's not necessary. I have other questions. OK, let me go to it quickly. Uh, on the topic of environmental justice, technological advances can play a crucial role in both identifying problems, threats, and providing otherwise unavailable or inaccessible data. The question is directed to any or all of you esteemed panelists. What role can the satellite marketplace play in understanding and addressing environmental issues? Yes. So if I can start with a story and then I'll get to that. Sorry, you have 22 seconds. Oh, so um, I teach a space policy class at Georgetown. And one of my students last year was an FBI environmental crimes analyst. Why she took the course on space is because she wanted to understand how space could be used to help address that mission. So, so absolutely. Um, it, suddenly, the, particularly the space uh, remote sensing data, you can use it for um, detecting illegal fishing, illegal mining, uh, illegal uh, foresting activities, um, destruction of coral mines in the South China Sea. You pair that data with the artificial intelligence we talked about earlier, and then these communication networks, you can get that processed data to anyone on the world. 
Thank you very much. The gentleman. I yield back. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to let, let the members know, we are at 10 minutes and 49 seconds for this vote to close, so we know there's a few minutes after that. Would there be any objection if we cut our time down about two minutes to ask so we can get, because otherwise we're going to come back um, for the, and I just don't want to hold these witnesses. So, uh, Mr. Wahlberg, uh, the gentleman from uh, Michigan is from Michigan 5 is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're great. I'm proud of you. I'm glad this, you had this hearing today. Um, Ms. Manor, in your testimony, you talk about the recent work of international standards bodies like GP, uh, 3GPP to facilitate interoperability between satellite networks and terrestrial networks. I've led legislation to promote U.S. wireless leadership um, in these standards bodies because it's important that our adversaries do not write the rules of the road. Uh, can you please elaborate on how you see the future of the satellite marketplace as it relates to the recent developments in these standards bodies? Yes, thank you. Um, so I view satellite as a complementary service, and we've heard today about, um, about my colleague from Link Service, but satellite operators are also putting their own frequency bands into cell phones today. And so you're gonna ha see a more robust marketplace with lots of different solutions, but also hybrid devices. Today we offer a hybrid IoT service um, that's both terrestrial and satellite. So you'll go to the most efficient and cost-effective method. So by having these standards enabled that include both satellite and terrestrial, it will be seamless to the user. We're working um, on technology that switches right now so that you would never know as the user whether you're using satellite or, ter or terrestrial. It'll be seamless, so it'll, okay. it'll be a same user experience. Essentially. Thank you. Staying on the same topic, Ms. Zoller, I, I understand that you've also led the U.S. at these international bodies and conferences. How do you recommend we approach this issue at an international level? Thank you for that question. It's absolutely essential that the U.S. government prioritize satellite issues at the International Telecommunication Union and the World Radio Communication Conference. It's a treaty conference that happens only every four years. A lot of countries look at the outcome and adopt it into our rules. We need those outcomes to be favorable and to promote U.S. innovation and economic growth. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back and submit my questions. If I could uh, just uh, interrupt my friend for a second. Uh, there's a couple of members that do want to come back after, so if you want to finish up with your last two minutes and 53 seconds, you have it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Ms. Bingen, uh, Bingen, Bingen, Bingen. Uh, this committee has uh, taken action to prevent uh, untrusted companies like Huawei and ZTE from offering service or having the equipment present in communications networks in the United States. If companies that raise similar national security concerns were to provide satellite services in the United States, what does that mean for American data and sensitive uses of satellite services? If a Chinese company, most likely backed by one of their state-owned enterprises, built and operates a system, whether it be space-based or terrestrial, I would be concerned that they would now have the the means and the access to uh, steal sensitive data, whether it be personal information, uh, sensitive technology, or, or business information, um, that, uh, that they would be able to conduct espionage, that they'd be able to block access, et cetera. Um, and I don't, I, I say this because they have a military civil fusion policy that basically says, hey, commercial, you've got to help our military. They have a national intelligence law that compels um, citizen that compels individuals and organizations to support their national intelligence activities and to keep it secret. So there's, there's more there that, that, that gives me concern. More there, there, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Ms. Manor, uh, back to you. You mentioned the need for increased U.S. support at the International Telecommunications Union and at the World Radio Communication Conference. What type of support did you have in mind? And secondly, how can the U.S. set itself up for success at the World a radio communication conference, and what would be a successful outcome? Thank you. Um, so first off, um, there has been times where the satellite industry um, is not fully represented in the U.S. positions at the WRC, and there tends to be favoritism towards certain technologies over satellite. For instance, um, we've seen some situations um, where 
the U.S. has favored positions that would actually harm the, FC, the satellite industry from deployment or continued use of certain frequency bands. So that's an area we're concerned with. Um, in terms of success at the U.S., I do think that we, this is one, um, um, this is one where I do think additional resources are critical. We're incredibly understaffed on the federal government side, in my view, at the WRC. We do an, a really good job with minimal resources, but having additional staff um, at the three agencies that tend to lead, which are the FCC, the Departments of Commerce, and TIA, and Department of State would certainly put us into a better situation. And we, we're already, I'm, I'm proud to say that we're seeing some support already for the for the preparation for the work, so early process, but that's something we're, we're doing a good job on, so thank you. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, the gentleman's time has expired, and the gentleman from Florida's 12th is recognized. And just let everybody know we're thank you. five minutes now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it very much. Uh, with recent uh, redistricting, now I represent Hernando and Citrus County in Florida, two wonderful counties. And meeting after meeting with constituents and local leaders, I regularly hear that internet connectivity and cell phone service are top issues to be addressed. As I have frequently uh, these frequent uh, these counties, I can agree it's a very serious problem going through those counties for many many years. Even though I didn't represent them, satellite innovation offers hope for these areas, especially to those where a terrestrial uh, networks are unrealistic due to marshy land conditions and hopefully neutralize the digital divide once and for all. So, uh, Mr. Strout, um, for realistic coverage uh, to consumers and as a stable business model, you need to, uh, to launch thousands of NGSO satellites. Does the FCC review and approve these as a whole in batches or one on, on one by one? What is the timeline for getting approvals? And is the regulatory process the same or different for geostationary satellites as we, as with the NGSO systems? Thank you for the question. And I actually might suggest deferring to one of my members who has actually been through the process and can give you the, the, the exact details in terms of time frames, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Thank you, I can speak to our experience. We applied for our FCC license in July of 2019 and received it in July of 2020. So it, it took a year, well ahead of our planned operation date. Very good, thank you. Moving to a different topic, uh, yesterday I chaired a hearing uh, very uh, honored to chair a hearing, subcommittee hearing on innovation data and commerce on the threats we face if, if China was to lead on emerging technologies such as autonomous vehicles. We're not gonna let that happen. Obviously, those threats exist as we navigate the satellite space as well in this race. Uh, Mr. Straub, again. Okay, uh, in if, your if I can interrupt you, gentlemen, for just one second. We were down under three minutes, so. Okay, yeah. all right, no problem. I'll, I'll submit the question. Okay. Is that you. okay? That's fine. All right, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. I yield back. Okay. Uh, at this time, we're going to recess uh, because we, the vote's getting down to about a minute and a half now. And as soon as, and I'm going to ask the members that are coming back, to, as soon as that last vote's over, to be right back here so we can get you all released for, uh, from your witness chairs. So thank you very much, and we stand in recess.
Well, good, after, good afternoon again. Thanks to our witnesses for waiting us for us as we went over and voted in this brief recess. The chair is going to recognize the uh, gentlelady from Tennessee for five minutes. Well, thanks for coming back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start with uh, Mrs. Deckard. You know, I serve a rural district in East Tennessee, and there's mountainous regions, Great Smoky Mountains uh, National Park, and we get more than double the number of visitors than anybody else does in the country at any other national park, as a matter of fact, is 14.1 million last year. But I say that to say this, your link system, we had uh, fires back in 2016 that killed 14 people. I know it's not like California, but it was devastating to that community. And if they had had access, they didn't have communication. Even the EMS responders didn't have communication with each other, so that was devastating. Uh, you say in your testimony that your model is to partner with carriers so they bring the spectrum and the customers, and you bring the space-based infrastructure to fill the gaps in the network. And my question is this, what kind of reception have you gotten from U.S. carriers, and how many partners do you need to offer this service? Thank you for the question. So the mobile network operators are very excited about the potential okay. for being able to extend their coverage. I think we're, you know, they're, they're open to learning about the technology and they want to make sure that um, it doesn't interfere with their terrestrial networks. And as Link was rolled out and as a function of our experimental licenses with the FCC, we actually give the mobile network operators in the U.S., within the spot beam of where we're operating them, we give them our test schedule, and they monitor and sign off on our tests. Okay. So over time, we've been building that relationship with them. And you actually only need one large mobile network operator, really, to go into the FCC to be able to wow. That's partner. good. Good to hear. Um, you know, we have the Appalachian Trail, too, and I know that I've hiked on that Appalachian Trail, and there is no service. I don't care if you have, you have to carry a GPS device to do that, but if we could do that on the phone, that would be fantastic. I know there's some apps you can download to tell you about the terrain, but... Thank you for what you've done with EMS, the and they've made a lot of corrections in Gatlinburg and different places after that fire. A lot of insufficiencies have been corrected because of that. I want to turn to you, Ms. Bingen, and uh, you know, it's astonishing in, in your testimony, you said in, to, in 2021, the U.S. National Geospatial Intelligence Agency assessed that China was a global leader in three and nine categories of commercially space-based imagery capabilities. And then you go on down to say the U.S. commercial providers maintain the lead in only three categories. If there's nine categories, who else leads in the, the other three, I guess is my question. So let's see, I'm looking at a chart, and NGA has this available as well. Mm -hmm. So the other three, uh, make sure I understand my flags here, Argentina, uh, Korea, uh, and then I believe this is Finland. Really? But I can get back to you on that. Well, that's just, it's, it's, it, our fight is against China in so many ways. So I just was curious, since they weren't listed, what they were. But I'm looking at the categories you did um, list. We need to be number one. We need to be ahead in all nine, basically. Thank you for that. And uh, I know I've got a little bit of time. This is for Mrs. Eller and uh, Ms. Manor. You know, I... I Told you before, I live in a very rural district. I have two distressed counties, and a lot of my constituents rely on satellite um, internet. And we know that Congress has spent an astronomical amount of money um, in the last two years, and of, of that, the vast majority of broadband funding is going to end up going toward fiber uh, for the last mile. Without significant permitting reform, you know, I have serious concerns about the money actually getting into internet, into the homes of the people I serve, because I know it's not there yet. You know, in the likely event that this money fails to deliver universal service for East Tennesseans, what level of service can my constituents expect from satellite internet, and what can Congress do to help satellite internet companies deliver stronger service in places like East Tennessee? So I think the good news is today, and and that's growing. There is um, some hundred. There is some high speed, higher speed service we're bringing, even higher speed than we have today. Later this year, and a number of other operators, and 
my colleagues from Amazon as well. Uh -huh. I think the bigger issue is the funding issue. Yeah. And unfortunately, the way BEAD is being implemented is a way that essentially closes the door for satellite broadband. So having an oversight hearing perhaps with NTIA to talk to them about how they're spending the money to make sure that it does get out. Mm -hmm. um, and as I talked about, it doesn't have to be the final solution. It could be an inter interim solution yeah. until other technologies can come. But satellite is up today, and it's continuing to grow. You know, we're putting up new satellites. A lot of other folks are. So you're seeing greater capability. So it's really an affordability issue. I have been to your district yeah. and love it there. So I, I It's the most beautiful part of Tennessee. It goes from Bristol Motor Speedway to Dollywood. So what else do you want, you know? Silver? Thank you. Leo Constellations are a great way to connect people in rural and remote communities around the world who are out of reach of traditional wired and wireless networks and who will stay that way. We look forward to serving your community. Um, I would agree with Ms. Manor that to the extent that funding is provided, it should be done so on a technology neutral basis. Yeah. Do you want to chime in, sir? I, I um, would agree with uh, both of my colleagues. I mean, the, the service is affordable. Um, it is available immediately, and there are more yeah. constellations being launched every day. So. I know. Why don't they understand this? Well, anyway, okay, I've talked to all of you, so I guess with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. The general lady's time has expired and yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank you and, and Ranking Member Matsui for allowing me to wave on. I, I served on this subcommittee for uh, 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 five terms, and uh, uh, it didn't work out that way this session, but I, these issues are all very, very important to me, so uh, you're going to get requests for me to wave on quite often, so I hope, hope that's okay. Miss um, uh, Zoller. Uh, I'm very excited about what you're doing with Project Kuiper and, and the prospects of LEO satellite broadband playing such a critical role in bridging the urban-rural digital divide, because uh, we got a lot of that problem in my rural Appalachian uh, district. Uh, and that, that's true for all the providers. Are there any specific actions that Congress could take that would assist in the FCC's ability to process license applications to keep up with the demand uh, so that th they can process it more efficiently. I'm excited too, and I appreciate your question. I think that the congressional attention on these issues is very motivating in terms of fostering motivation uh, within the commission to, to move out on some rulemakings, to make more spectrum available for non-geostationary satellite systems, aligning the U.S. rules with what's available more globally already, and to also clarify how we will share spectrum with each other in the future, because that lack of clarity can be the source of a lot of controversy during the application process. Sure. Are, are, are there other regulatory hurdles that you're facing for Project Kuiper to successfully launch your satellites and provide these services? The international regulatory landscape is a patchwork of, of different rules and, and requirements. Many countries look to the ITU for guidance on how to allocate spectrum, what services should share together, and so on. And many are behind the United States in terms of making decisions that would enable non-geostationary systems. So I think it's really important that the U.S. go to the World Radio Conference with a strong voice, a very pro-satellite voice, and, and help us move the rule set in the direction that it enables American innovation. Okay, all right. Uh, continuing, uh, Ms. Zoller, in your testimony, you mentioned the importance of the U.S. presenting key priorities at that World Radio Communications Conference uh, later. You just mentioned some of them, uh, the, the moving, uh, you know, 
speaking with a loud voice. Are there other messages that the U.S. should be given at that uh, conference? A particular area of importance is the mobility of earth stations for non-geostationary systems. It's something we already allow here in the United States for systems like ours, but it's not the case globally. And this is an issue on the agenda of the 2023 World Radio Conference. And we'd like to see a good decision out of the conference, knowing that it's four years between treaty events and could be many, many more before such an issue is revisited. Okay. Um, Mr. Stroop, in your testimony, you mentioned China's investments in satellite systems and the services they're offering uh, at below market rate or free globally. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very concerning from a national security standpoint in addition to commercially for U.S. competitors because we all know there are likely a lot of unknown and unintended consequences of letting the Chinese play in that global marketplace. What specific ways can Congress support domestic innovation and bring U.S. providers back to a more level playing field internationally? Yeah, I think ensuring the health of uh, satellite providers is one of the key aspects of it because um, certainly what they're seeking to do is consistent with some of the uh, other infrastructure investments that they've made in various countries and ultimately to have a successful constellation, whether it's a geo or non-geo system, you want to provide service globally. So I think that helping to ensure the the, uh, the strength of the industry through the many things that we've talked about, access to spectrum, stable regulatory environment, are all key things to ensuring uh, uh, the competitiveness of, of, of our companies. Okay, all right. Well, Mr. Chairman, again, thanks for allowing me to wave on, and I yield back. The, the gentleman yields back, and uh, seeing no other members here wishing to ask questions, I want to, th again, thank the uh, panel for being with us today. I think that, as you can tell from every, all the questions you had and all the, so many members being here uh, wanting to ask those questions, that uh, it's a fascinating topic, one that we have to be very, very concerned about. So I, again, I just want to thank you, and I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the documents included on the staff hearing documents list. Without objection, that will be the order. Without objection, so ordered. Pursuant to committee rules, I remind members they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask the witnesses to respond to the questions promptly. Members should submit their record questions by the close of the business on February the 16th. And without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you very much.